good evening or good afternoon, everyone. So depending on where you are, uh, our workshop, uh, this uh, second half, our IEEE CAS uh, seasonal school for uh, AI machine learning for IC design and EDA. So uh, this uh, event is organized by Professor Andrew Kang uh, at UCSD, and uh, uh, I'm David Pan from UT Austin. So uh, as you, uh, uh, many of you probably already attended the first uh, uh, half of the uh, this seasonal school. So uh, in two weeks ago, uh, we had uh, six, uh, you know, uh, outstanding uh, talks uh, from uh, different uh, uh, topics from, you know, industry and uh, academia on deeper and reinforcement learning and also uh, machine learning applications. So on this weekend, uh, we have, uh, uh, not, not yet weekend, but today and tomorrow, right? So we have, uh, you know, five uh, speakers uh, covering, you know, standard platforms for machine learning, EDA and IC design, and also, you know, machine learning for manufacturability, testing, reliability, and security, you know, this uh, emerging uh, issues. So, um, you know, today uh, we have uh, two uh, kind of group of talks, uh, each actually one and a half hours uh, and with uh, even demos. So um, I'll explain uh, the today's speaker soon, um, who is uh, Karen uh, Kalafasa plus plus. We have actually two co-presenters, <laughs> so I, I will introduce them uh, separately. So we're going to talk about uh, exchanging EDA data and machine learning using standard APIs. and. Uh, uh, then uh, we will have another uh, IEEE C the DATC uh, you know uh, activity, which actually is an open source uh, and uh, activity establishing research foundation for machine learning enabled ED and IC design. Um, so uh, I would like to thank uh, you know the Leslie uh, and uh, Lindsay from UCSD for the support from Telos. By the way, yeah, this uh, seasonal workshop is uh, uh, sponsored by IEEE CAS Society, but meanwhile also sponsored by IEEE, by the NSF AI Institute uh, uh, Telos. Uh, so um, thank them for a lot of help. And also uh, our student organizers here, uh, Jia Chi Gu from UT Austin, uh, Seyak from UCSD, and uh, Zhang Wang from UCSD and Karen Zhu from uh, UT Austin, right? Okay, so with that, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, this speakers today. Uh, so we have uh, the first. Uh, we have three speakers, and the, the speaker first speaker is uh, Karen uh, Kal Karen Karen uh, Kalafala. Uh, he is a senior technical staff member at IBM and a co-chair of the AI ML for EDA special interest group of SI2. So um, Karen is uh, a longtime IBMer, and he uh, is an IBM Academy of Technology member, uh, which is uh, uh, you know, the high, uh, one of the highest level of IBM uh, technology, uh, technology uh, Academy. And uh, um, actually, I worked at IBM many years ago. Uh, so actually, uh, we even had some interaction at that time, like 20 years ago, right? Yep, so yep, uh, really I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really my great pleasure to uh, really introduce uh, Karen. He's a master, IBM master inventor, and uh, uh, you know a lot of things uh, you guys probably can read. Uh, one thing I would like to emphasize: he's the lead architect of uh, EDA analytics and a static timing analysis software used uh, by um, IBM and uh, verified some of the world's fastest microprocessors. And uh, uh, he has uh, received the. Uh, ACM IEEE Technical Impact Award in EDA and uh, also many other awards. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm not going to read uh, this. You guys have all the uh, details uh, in the in the uh, you know announcement. And uh, so yeah, really glad to have uh, oops uh, Karen with us and his co-presenters. He has two co-presenters for the first talk, including some demos. And another co-presenter is uh, Richard Taka. Uh, he's a senior software engineering manager at IBM. And uh, uh, so he got his BS and MS degrees uh, in computer science and joined IBM EDA in 2012. And uh, he has also been working with SI2 as a co-chair of the SI2 satellite team for standardizing uh, data sharing um, in silicon uh, to system design flows, right? As we know, right, machine learning needs a lot of data, and how do we standardize all this? Right, this is very important. 
And the third co-presenter, uh, Akhilesh uh, Kuma, is a principal R&D engineer at ANSYS. And uh, uh, Dr. Kuma uh, so has been working on advanced EDA reliability. You know, ANSYS is a more analysis company, right? You know, power, thermal, electrical, thermal, ESD, and uh, so on and so forth, right? So he has, uh, he's a uh, leading expert here. And he's also the chair of SI2 satellite team on standardizing data sharing. And uh, excuse me, he has published many papers, including you know ML AI for EDA. And uh, so, all right, with all that, uh, let's uh, get started. So let me unshare the screen, and uh, Karen, you can take on from here. Okay, wonderful. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, uh, by the way, some logistics before while you are uh, yeah so. Yes. Uh, for this talk, uh, we have almost 100 uh, people in the audience now, right? So please type your questions into the chat box. And Karen uh, and other co-presenters, right? You don't answer questions until the end, right? We'll answer all the questions uh, uh, at, toward the end. So um, please mute everyone. Please mute yourself. And uh, um, yeah, okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much for the very kind introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation to present today. Uh, I've been fortunate in my own career, as I'm sure Rich and Akilash have, to work with a very large team of smart, talented, and very hardworking engineers. Um, so, okay, uh, so let's get on with the presentation. We're going to divide this talk into three parts, as I'll describe in a minute. So, just going to advance to the next page. Uh, so in today's presentation, we're going to be introducing efforts which are underway via the SI2 Technology Interoperability Trajectory Advisory Council. I'm just going to call that Titan for short, because that's a mouthful to say. And these efforts are geared towards developing a standard API for exchanging EDA process data. I'm gonna begin by providing just a very broad overview of the SI2 Titan effort in order to put the rest of this presentation in proper context. Next, I'm going to hand off to my colleague, Rich Taggart, who will bring you up to speed on the secure processed data exchange for EDA, which we'll henceforth refer to as SPEED, API efforts, which began roughly a year ago and have culminated in a new working group proposal to develop a detailed specification and reference implementation for the SPEED API. Finally, Akilesh Kumar will take over and articulate a future vision for the SPEED API working group as we uh, endeavor towards developing specifications and actual reference implementations. Taking a step back for a moment in order to provide a larger context, the, the Titan Council was formed by the SI2 Board of Directors uh, within the past year with a focus on identifying gaps and proposing solutions for overall silicon to system interoperability. Titan is proud to currently represent 15 member companies. I'm the current Titan chair. Rob Christie from ARM is our co-chair. I wanna get a few more acknowledgements in here before I move on. Vic Kalkarni, the SI2 Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. Leanne Clevinger, who is the SI2 VP of technology, both provide the glue to make sure that Titan is well interlocked with both our board of directors, as well as Titans of the industry, pun intended. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on. So on page three, the purpose of the newly created Titan Council is to be a trusted advisor to the SI2 board of directors. So how do we do this? So Titan works to identify and bring to the SI2 board's attention challenges related to advanced silicon design. Furthermore, Titan receives direction from the board on high level business and technical concerns in order to translate these into specific plans of action. 
in consultation with our board of directors, the current areas of focus are 3D integration, technology interoperability, and data security at the API level. That's what most of this talk today is going to be about, and multi-platform hybrid cloud enablement. Moving to the next page of my introductory material, as I mentioned, one of the key challenges that the Titan Council has on its radar is technology interoperability and security at the API layer. So in this chart, you can see a very interesting perspective, and I want to make sure I give the right credit. I think this was shared originally by Qualcomm. And this talks about the need to augment design data that's typically available in a database such as open access with a new API layer that allows similar standard access to processed data. I think it's important to define right at the outset, what do we mean by process data? That term appears right in the acronym, Speed API. So think of process data as all the computed information such as the results of, say, timing, power, and noise analysis, which are derived through the detailed simulation of the design data, say, in OA. So in summary, what this chart is stating is that the industry is in, is in need and wants a standard way to access process data that's both vendor agnostic as well as via an interface, which allows for fine gain grain control of who can get access to which pieces of information. Think of the security aspect like access control lists for process data, wherein one might typically provide a token or a license key, which defines entitlements based upon which a specific user is granted access to a particular piece of data. So for example, user X, may be able to access the processed or simulation data across an entire design. Another user Y may be restricted from viewing the process data for a particular portion, say a sensitive IP component. So I know that this is a AI machine learning school, but as I'm sure has been mentioned elsewhere in this symposium, all AI and machine learning starts with data. I'm just going to shift gears for a minute to give you a sense of some of the other activities that Titan is involved in so you can build a few connections. Uh, the next challenge, just stepping away from the Speed API for a second, actually has to do with 3D IC integration. So SI2 partners, and I think the chart we're looking at here might have some data uh, courtesy of Intel, have expressed interest in reusing known good designs by decoupling specific IP components that do not need to be on the core or most advanced process node. So I'm sure many of you have heard of this already by breaking up large monolithic designs into smaller chiplets that can be designed independently and then integrated in a heterogeneous either 3D or 2.5D interposer architecture. It's hoped that this can lower R&D costs like reusing existing IP, reducing manufacturing overhead by the same reasoning, reusing something that already works, and improving yields by perhaps uh, manufacturing the individual components in, in, in smaller individual design sizes and then integrating those die either in a 2.5D interposer layer or in a 3D architecture. On the next chart. Another area that Titan is involved in has to do with technology data interoperability. So for example, end users and end user companies, companies who use EDA tools are interested in improving power performance in area of design through both interoperability between vendor tools, as well as in the use of AI ML in the design methodology to, to meet their performance objectives in a highly constrained environment. And on this chart here, you can see some goals identified for the data management and workflow satellite group that's being sponsored under Titan. So just to recap, 
with the prior charts in mind, the Titan Council has been asked by the SI2 Board of Directors to focus this year on establishing a roadmap for this, the Speed API, which we'll get much more in detail in this presentation, 3D and 2.5D IC interoperability, and multi-vendor workflows. So what's Titan's role in this? What has our approach been so far? So Titan's approach has been to form three satellite groups which focus on each of these areas. The first step, just to reflect back on the past year, has been to identify industry leaders, staff each of our satellite groups, and align on overall expectations. Um, in general, for each of the, these three challenges, we'd like the corresponding satellite group to formulate ideas. Um, first, collecting input through an industry and academia survey, then identifying gaps and documenting those in some kind of a white paper with block diagrams and so forth. Um, we have the support of the board we, uh, where it makes sense, which means we have the support of our board of directors and resource identified. We'll be looking to transition each of these satellite groups into a proper implementation or working group in order to deliver new IP solutions. So at this juncture, I just want to give you a sense of the leadership and staffing picture for each of the Titan satellites. Um, so at this juncture, we have roughly six to eight participants identified for each of the three satellite groups. All member organizations are welcome to participate and academic organizations are eligible for a no cost SI2 membership. So if you have an affinity towards any of these projects and an interest in getting involved, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to arrange the appropriate introductions. Okay, now with this very high level picture in place, I'm going to turn the floor over to Rich Taggart to begin our journey on the Speed API. So I'll stop here. I'll quit sharing. So Rich, you can jump in. There Super. we go. Thanks, Kareem. And I'm just making sure that uh, you can hear me okay here. Yep. Awesome. There we go. And you should see the, uh, the full screen view. We do, yes. Great. So um, thanks, Kareem, and also David and everyone for organizing this. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the second portion of this talk and going into a little bit more detail about what we mean when we talk about the secure process data or speed API. This is a Titan satellite group. And generally, as Kareem mentioned, the objective for these satellite groups are to perform a survey and try to identify any gaps or opportunities that exist at the industry level. And so this group was formed a few years ago to take a look at this space and try to determine what are the opportunities for securing this EDA process data and how do we um, standardize that so that everyone can take advantage of it. If you have any more questions or if you're interested, feel free to go to the SI2 website and there's a whole bunch of information on Titan, including the Speed API there. So for the Speed API satellite group, generally speaking, our objective is to enable design engineers and other engineers within the silicon industry to be able to analyze, interpret, and improve the quality of their designs by leveraging an interconnected ecosystem and using accepted data science methods from multiple vendor tools and also uh, cloud-based solutions in this heterogeneous type of ecosystem. 
What does that mean exactly for us? So in order to create a system like this today, a team or a company would need to put significant investment into all of the various components that would be required to achieve that goal and implement a system that can support that. The Speed API um, satellite group back in 2021 released a, I think this is the reference to the white paper. Yeah, released a white paper where they performed a survey on across the industry to try to answer that question that I just posed. And they determined, yes, there would be significant investment from the industry to be able to implement something like this. And there's also a huge opportunity for us to come up with a standard and agree on a way that we can implement this complex system in a heterogeneous environment so that we can all benefit and leverage from the work that we're all doing. I'll just highlight here that implementing AI and ML systems, especially in the space of EDA, will require a significant size of managed and processed data. And so being able to manage and process, analyze, and, and all of those things, um, as I mentioned already, would require significant investment from us. If we consider one particular use case of a design engineer who's working on an integrated circuit, typically I see design, especially in the context of analog circuits or complicated microprocessors and other things is an arduous and iterative process. Design automation is not simply one and done. And throughout this process, typically engineers ask the questions, what happened, why did it happen, and how do we improve? So that they take their design version, they run it through all of the synthesis, and analysis tools, that ends up generating a large pile of data and leaves our engineers with those questions that I just mentioned. If we think about this problem in the context of all of the tools that are involved and all of the data that's generated, we can break that down into generally two distinct areas data analysis and visualization, so effectively helping our engineers become more productive in this process, answer questions that they have, and being able to make data-driven decisions. So this requires an immense amount of data processing and being able to leverage all of the work that the open source community has been doing like um, using Python and data frames and other accepted data visualization processes to help answer those. On the other side, there, the Speed API satellite group has identified a huge opportunity for the industry to leverage AI and machine learning, both on the training side and also in inferencing to help our automation tools become more effective and also run more quickly, hoping to avoid any extraneous or unnecessary simulations. So in this case, the goal here would be to learn, identify, and apply trends to be able to automate the decision-making process and as we all know, that requires a huge amount of data, specifically labeled and trusted data, as well as the ability to deploy data models that we trust and that represent our data set so that our tools can become more effective. 
So in this context, I can share one example of, of how we've been using data visualization. This is one example that was presented at DAC in 2021, I believe, of being able to help a design engineer answer those questions that we mentioned, specifically what happened or being able to form a high level view of what's going on so that an engineer has an idea of where problems might be poking, uh, might be exposed. If we take a look at the picture on the left, you'll notice the number, in this case, the number of timing analysis failures that were reported for a particular design over the course of time so that we can see where things are getting worse, where they're getting better. Uh, similarly, we can break a specific design and compare different aspects of it to make sure that our engineers are focusing their time and energy on solving the hardest problems. If we go one step deeper, you'll notice the picture on the right allows somebody to look at the specific details of those fails and try to figure out how they can address them, allowing our engineers to become more productive and focus on the hard problems. Similarly, in the case of AI and machine learning, there's, I'm sure as we all know, a whole bunch of steps involved that are required from being able to generate or synthesize data that can be used for training, processing that data and going through the whole sanitization process. And then finally, finding an algorithm or a model that can be trained and tuned and then deploying that model in an environment where it can be used either built into whatever analysis tool is being run or as a post process to help us understand what's going on. So as I meant, or as I alluded to, and as the speed API, well, let me say it this way, the speed API satellite group as part of these surveys identified a lot of common infrastructure that everybody would need to invest significant time and resource in building. For example, having hardware and compute resources, as I mentioned, the EDA data or and being able to store and archive that data, doing the retrieval processing visualization. As you can see here, the list goes on and on and on, and it goes way off the page. For a concrete list, I would recommend that you take a look at that white paper that I mentioned earlier, which is included as a reference to this um, presentation here. And if anyone's interested, we can certainly share the location of, of how to do how to find that. So the satellite group identified a clear need and opportunity where we can all come together and create a standard for how we can generate all of this data and process it in a way that works for everybody. So I'll reiterate it here. The Speed API Titan Satellite Group is currently, actually has finished a proposal for a stand, uh, no, I'm sorry, is currently working on a proposal for a standardized interface to enable EDA data that can be used in this heterogeneous hybrid cloud environment that I mentioned. So as I said, the satellite group has performed several surveys and uh, done a deep dive on this space. 
and is now starting to form an open standards working group. So I would say for any SI2 members, if you're interested in helping us determine what this standardized interface and API might look like, please come join us. We're, we're interested in having you work with us. So um, with that, I think that concludes my portion of this talk. And Akalesh, I believe you're on here and can speak about the future of the Speed API and give some more details um, on what we're thinking. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rich. Uh, let me um, share my slide. Yeah, I hope the slides are, uh, the slide is visible, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. It's like at a full screen, I guess. Yeah, I'll go into the, yeah. <clears throat> Perfect, um, thank you. Th yeah. Thanks, uh, Kareem and Rich, for uh, setting up uh, the platform for the Speed API, clearly articulating what's the role of Titan, and uh, what we have done so far in Speed API, providing a background of the white paper that uh, did a deep dive on the requirements, the infrastructure gaps, and and why we need such a such a system. And uh, and hopefully by now, um, most of you would be convinced that okay, there's a, there's a good need of there's a, a good need for such a Speed API system which can actually help um, access, provide access to process data from uh, various silicon to system flows, um, EDA platforms, EDA flows, and, and so on. And, and then again, this requirement is not only um, for on-prem um, um, EDA flows, but once, the, once these uh, design flows, EDA flows, they move on to the cloud platforms, these will become even more uh, the speed API system will become even more relevant the requirement for such a such a uh, standardized way um and and as more, as designs move uh, as designs become more complex and and not as, uh, there there cannot be a single uh, EDA platform uh, which can imagine all the different kinds of applications that can be developed on on top of uh, such uh, design flows such uh, EDA platforms it's it's imperative that we have a uh, a set of APIs uh, which can provide um, access to process data on which uh, end users can can develop um, uh, various applications um, and and this is again specifically tar targeting data intensive applications um, AI ML applications now. Um, and and this will the such a speed API system will enable. Um, um, end users to customize the flows. And, and we know that uh, we have heard from various uh, end users, big design companies that uh, uh, the requirements, they uh, in, in, in many cases, the requirements are so specific that they cannot use uh, standard e EDA flows. They have to create some custom flows on, on, on their um, on, on their side. And, and they are writing, um, they're creating custom scripts, custom code for, um, processing the data that's being um, dumped out of the EDA flows. And, and it's hard to maintain that code. And once the, the formats or, or uh, uh, the uh, a new version of the, uh, the EDA tool comes out or, or you change something in the, in the EDA flow, uh, things start to break. And it's very hard for the end user to, to uh, maintain or uh, update those uh, custom code, custom scripts for their specific, um, let's say, data intensive or AI ML um, application, and and with that, uh, what uh, as as Rich and and Karim actually explained, we we set out to develop uh, this Speed API system. Uh, we went through um, um, the standard process of of creating a working group proposal and and going through uh, the approval of that for that working group proposal. So. Um, so we are right now. We are in in in, in the phase of investigating um, what kind of um, speed API specifications uh, we should come up with. Uh, the working group should come up with, and 
Um, so here, here are some of the future. So, so, so what I'll talk about is the future directions of uh, such a speed API the uh, system, which the working group is looking into. Um, so here are some of the key bullet points. Of course, this is not the exhaustive list, uh, but um, um, but again, what we are focusing on first is to identify some of the example use cases, uh, um, which uh, which can form um, uh, a reference implementation prototyping, um, and again, um, develop a prototype for the speed API. With this, with these use cases, so we are trying to identify a few use cases, and with this, these use cases, we want to demonstrate um, how Speed API system can help uh, in, in solving um, complex uh, AI ML problems, right? And um, complex AI ML flows. Uh, again, remember uh, when we talk about um, um, uh, AI ML applications, we're not talking about a single AI ML application. We are talking about the complete uh, AI ML um, pipeline, right? And again, and, and this this needs to be maintained over over the years, right? So um, there are various complexities that I'll, I'll go into in, in a bit, right? Um, again, identify some of the best practices for the Speed API system so that it is robust, scalable, um, extensible, Again, not uh, serving just one use case or a few use cases, right? So again, some of the best practices. So just identify those. And then uh, recommend method methodologies for uh, standardizing these speed APIs. So um, we, we'll go into, into how, how these speed APIs can, can be standardized or what parts should be standardized, what parts should be left uh, to the user to uh, to come up with their own specific um, design. So uh, before we go into some of the details of, of uh, uh, the future directions, um, let's look at an example of process data. When we talk about um, process data, we've been talking about process data. And just to give you some concrete idea about, about process data, here's, here's what we really mean about process data. So this is, this is an example. Um, so this this was published sometime in 2019, and um, I won't go into into the flow of, of this example how, what or or explain explain what it what it tried to do. Just uh, um, uh, this this was a this was a work on on timing path selection for with with uh, dynamic voltage drop. Um, so keeping in uh, taking into account the voltage drop uh, again a dynamic voltage drop uh, for maximum time timing push up. Again, that's that's not important, but the important part is uh, if you look at the list of the process data that was used in this in this ML flow, uh, you have we used a bunch of a uh, bunch of data. So things like average timing sensitivity with respect to DVD, average effective R and uh, resistance, um, effective decap, and and so on. So all, all this data was was created using custom code and and again um, custom code custom scripts. And, and this was again pulled out of of, um, of our database um, uh, from from our tool, right? Um, and again, this is uh, pretty cumbersome, right? As you can imagine, right? Uh, keeping track of all this, making sure that uh, we are dumping out reports, and the, the format of the report changes. You need to go back and update the reports, and again prepare the data in a <clears throat> in a very standard format. Uh, which can be fed to the AI ML pipeline, right? Um, so that's that's where some of these requirements come into picture, right? So uh, the EDA tools uh, uh, would, the designers, the end users would like uh, the EDA tools to automatically digest or read the, the raw data coming out of the tools and, and again, generate the process data. So the, this process data, which is, um, <clears throat> which should be, which uh, ideally should be in a standard format and, and can be directly fed to the um, to the AI ML pipeline, right? Um, and uh, this should be made available through through the uh, through the Speed API uh, or an API, right? And okay. and that's mm -hmm. sorry, someone had a question or oh, it's okay now. Sorry, yeah, oh. we, we just I couldn't hear you anymore. Anyway, it's good. Oh, okay, yeah. it's good. Okay. Um, 
So uh, the next requirement, of course, when we talk about industry level deployments, um, uh, it should be extensible, scalable, and again, move, many of these PDA flows, they are moving to cloud. So uh, the speed APIs uh, should be cloud friendly. Um, uh, and again, extensible simply because uh, it is a rapidly uh, evolving space and, and just the needs and the requirements, they would definitely change over the time. Uh, so the framework should be extensible so that uh, we can add uh, to it or extend um, add enhancements to it. Uh, it should be easy to enhance, maintain, and so on, right? And uh, so this uh, this the Speed API should uh, should provide uh, data in again reiterating the same thing uh, in, in in a format that it's it's much easier to build applications. Um, uh, AI ML applications on on the end users uh, side, right? So the end users should be able to consume that data in a standard format and not worry about uh, creating some standard formats. Um, ideally, these uh, the, the process data should be uh, provided in in a format which uh, which some of these modern AI ML platforms, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever you talk about, can can consume, right? Um, in 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 its um, uh, very user friendly manner. So ease of use is definitely uh, one of the top most requirements. Uh, so this slide and the next slide. Uh, thanks. Uh, so thanks to Professor Red Davis uh, for uh, helping uh, me with the slide. Um, so uh, so this he, he clearly distilled down down this uh, this paper uh, which we are looking into as as one of the possible use cases right um this is this is again an example on on powered delivery network optimization um so uh trying to balance uh the the voltage drop and the routing congestion right so uh the optimization needs over there so how how do we uh create um an optimum um pdn uh network for each region of the chip. So that's the, and, and this was an ML application. So this is one of the uh, use cases that uh, we are trying to study and, and see uh, if uh, Speed API can, can um, be applied uh, to, to this uh, use case. Um, so uh, we, we have a lot of distribution of data, technology data with Foundry, design data uh, we, we have uh, from, from the chip vendor. So again, uh, this is this is a complex design problem um and and this paper um published in 2020 um it, it tried to use uh, uh, cnn to to predict the optimal pdn uh, for, for each region of the chip so the important part here that i wanted to uh, highlight is um is if you look at at the flow right here uh, we have got some des design features we have got the optimization loop where uh, I think simulated annealing and, and circuit solve in the matrix solve that's going on. And you're creating um, PDN labels, which uh, form the uh, the template, uh, the optimum PDL, PDN template for each region. And uh, these design features, they go into the uh, the training step and, and you create the, uh, the design features along with the PDN labels. They go into the training step and, and you create the CNN model out of it. And this is, uh, so uh, if you look into this, this work, again, this, this involves a lot of different um, um, complex uh, data, right? Uh, which uh, again is, it's being created through several steps, right? Um, again, a, a perfect example where uh, you would want a standard way of, of accessing um, uh, this data so that it can be fed into um, a machine learning pipeline, right? And then um, over the time, what will happen is uh, whether you use CNN model or use something else, uh, this, this pipeline, uh, this, this data pipeline should be able to feed to different machine learning models. And, and um, you can try out various, uh, uh, play with different models and, and come up with the, with the best one. Um, so just uh, just touching, so this is an example uh, ML pipeline. So I think many of you would be familiar with this uh, overall framework. Uh, just wanted to bring up to speed. Uh, 
So a typical machine learning pipeline would on, on the left side, you have um, on the left side, you have the typical machine learning pipeline where you have the, the data storage uh, containing the raw data. You've got the, uh, the data ingestion component um, uh, followed by the data preparation, which, which does all the uh, process of cleaning the data, removing unwanted data, normalization, featureization, and so on, right? And then uh, you have the model selection um, followed by training and, and validation of the model. Uh, and finally, the model deployment. Now, remember um, when we talk about, and, and on the right side, you have got, um, so I, I'll come a bit on, on to the right side, but um, so remember when, when we talk about model deployment, we are talking about some of these model deployments, which um, um, these, these model deployments can be pretty complex where uh, you you have multiple models, and once you deploy those those models, uh, you, you would ideally you would want to do uh, things like transfer learning. You want you would want to um, um, train these uh, update these models on on the fly, um, and and then um, typically what would happen in in a in a real industrial scale deployments, you would have multiple models, and and you would um, um, as as the Let's say you change the technology, you know, new design data comes in. So you would uh, you would promote one model, you would demote another model, um, and and these things these things they need to happen um, concurrently, right? So some of the models would start performing better, the other model would. So all all these uh, they they need to be taken care of in in the model deployment phase, right? Um, uh, so model promotion is is another complex aspect, right? Um, so on, on the right side, what we talk about is um, is how how we are envisaging um, a, a typical EDS flow would look like in in a in an AIML pipeline. Um, you would have uh, and and what's the role of these uh, data model APIs or the speed APIs? So you would have uh, a data warehouse or a data lake containing um, raw data. So it can be uh, several EDA databases, right? And then, of course, you have EDA applications or tools. They can also fed uh, feed uh, data to the, these data model APIs. So, data model APIs with these speed APIs, you can actually query data from from either um, data warehouse containing all all the data, and or uh, you can uh, possibly query data from EDA applications. Um, um, finally, what you can do is. Uh, Create a feature store. Um, so this is this is uh, uh, just an overall flow that we are looking into. Uh, create a feature store um, where you would perform the data cleaning, um, various kinds of transformations, feature engineering, and then store the data in in a let's say in a standard format. Um, so this is this feature store can be created by the user um, for their uh, model training or model serving, right? So you can actually uh, from from this feature store, um, uh, you could you can uh, clean various models, uh, determine which model is the best, uh, perform model serving, or, or and and then eventually model promotion, right? Um, so this is this is one of the flows, uh, um, an example pipeline. Um, again, um, just some of the highlights of of uh, the speed API that that we are looking into. Um, um, so, uh, one of the things that we are looking into, can the speed API extract the same data from multiple tools in, in, in some standard format, uh, by same data, I mean the same type of data, um, uh, save date, uh, extract data from previously saved raw data, um, provide a consistent interface, uh, um, to prepare data for, uh, machine learning training and deployment, debugging capabilities. So, uh, that's that's one of the uh, one of the very important aspects, right? So once, uh, which is again um, a, a big concern for EDA applications in AI ML, right? How how do we provide debug capabilities? So we are looking into whether uh, Speed API can provide uh, some help over there as well. Can it provide uh, um, some support for debugging capabilities uh, with uh, um, certain kind of data access, right? Um, certain kind of, uh, let's say, an example could be: um, Can it provide uh, data access uh, for error reports, right? Uh, for uh, various kinds of errors that 
that uh, uh, happen in the flow. So that's that's one of the things we are looking into. Um, data formats. Uh, uh, so can Speed API provide uh, data in, in some of these uh, modern data for the modern ML pipeline in some of these uh, big data formats, right? TFR records, Petastorm, JSON. Um, so in, in, in n number of formats. So uh, various examples can be there, right? So that's uh, um, that's another example. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, again, uh, when, when we start talking about API, um, the earlier slide just focused on the overall framework. So when, when we start talking about API, one of the example APIs, uh, one of the example architectures, that's the REST API. That's that's something that uh, we are looking into, um, whether this can be used for uh, a speed API system, right? Um, I'll not go into the detail of the REST API, and it's it's widely available. Just point, just uh, just briefly touch upon how it looks like. So you've got a request um, which um, has a header, operation endpoints, and then you pass some pa parameters, and then you get some um, a, re uh, a response. Um, a simplified example how how um, in, in 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 Python how you would uh, 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 an example could could look like um, so this is not to say that this is this is an uh, this is what Speed API is is doing it will will do but uh, this is just to give you uh, uh, an idea about um, how how easy it can be uh, uh, to access data right if we have uh, standard formats right. Um, so, so we are looking into 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 uh, possibly using using this format, or but again, all, everything is 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 under investigation right now. So we are just starting. Um, possible use case model. Um, so let's say so. This is this uh, chart is just showing um, when you have um, EDA process data from from two different EDA suppliers, right? Um, so you have got. Um, um, EDA supplier A, EDA supplier B, um, you've got uh, process data, EDA process data coming out of uh, several tools um, or flows from vendor uh, supplier A. Uh, you've got several um, uh, process data. Well, so these, these data can be in, 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 in any format, tabular, graphical data, metadata, statistics, debug uh, data, and so on. So you have got a bunch of EDA process data coming out of uh, different EDA suppliers. Now, how, so right now, the only way to process uh, this data is to create custom scripts uh, for each of these different EDA process data, right? Um, this process data can, can be um, um, written down in, let's say, it, it, uh, it can be as simple as written down in a file or it's in a, in a, in a, in a database. Uh, but again, you need to create custom code, custom scripts for accessing that data. Now, once uh, if if uh, the Speed API system, uh, if these process data, EDA process data becomes compliant with the Speed API system, the end user doesn't need to worry about um, which uh, e, uh, where 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 the data source is or what is the data source, right? Which EDA supplier is is the source of data. So with this speed API system, um, both these uh, the, the end user can feed the MLM data pipeline from um, any of these uh, EDA process databases or data sources. Um, so that's uh, that will provide a seamless integration of, of multiple EDA suppliers um, from um, to, to the to the MLM data pipeline of the end user. So the speed API will be very useful for, in in this case. Um, so finally, looking at um, um, some of the proposed features, uh, I think um, Rich and Kareem touched a little bit on, on this. Um, um, so we are looking at providing authentication and data encryption. Um, so authentication, again, um, uh, which users uh, are, ac uh, are allowed access to this uh, EDA process data. So when I go back to the the slide, the speed API system, this slide, the speed API system um, will allow uh, uh, only authenticated users access to uh, to this process data. So 
Uh, so let's say an end user might be allowed access to only uh, EDS supplier A uh, or, or only parts of data from EDS supplier A. So uh, they may not be able to access, so this PDPI system will not allow access to the EDS supplier B, right? So, um, and, and so on. So um, the data encryption, again, that's, that's one of the key requirements. Um, for um, security purposes. So um, many of these IPs, their designs, they are very sensitive. Uh, they, are, they contain confidential information, uh, sensitive information. Um, so data encryption is, is one of the requirements uh, for, for the speed API system. Um, the EDA flows, they are uh, uh, moving on, on to the cloud-based systems. Um, cloud-based platforms. Uh, so we definitely want to have uh, speed, speed API support, uh, cloud platforms, um, cloud hosted data sources, um, standardized API formats. Again, this stems from, from the fact that we want to integrate, uh, we want to provide uh, a very standard way of accessing data so that uh, the end user doesn't need to worry about the data source. Um, or or how the structure of the data source uh, just worry about the the queries that the end user will will create uh, for accessing um, the data from the the data source and then so those queries will can can uh, the responses from those queries they can be fed directly into the uh, data intensive or AI ML application. Um, finally, uh, so this is this has got more to do with. Uh, um, how how the APIs will be maintained, right? So, um, so the Speed API system should provide flexibility for uh, API registration, um, some way of doing versioning, um, provide data on usage metrics. So this is more of an, a Speed API management uh, part. Um, so Finally, we, we come on to the open questions. And again, um, we wanted, uh, so Fritch Karim and, and myself, we wanted this to be more of an interactive session. Um, so some of these open questions that we are looking into, what is the framework which is most suitable for, for such a speed API system, right? Um, how do we handle disparate EDA, EDA databases, right? Again, we want to be, uh, we want the speed API to work with um, multiple EDA databases or data sources. Um, what are the specific functionalities that should be provided by these APIs, right? Um, identify example use cases. That's, um, again, that's, that's uh, we are actively looking into, into that. Um, the final thing is how do we, uh, some of these things that we talked about, authentication, um, um, standard API formats, um, or, or uh, versioning and management, API management, these uh, there there are lots of publicly available applications and source codes that's uh, available out there, right? So how can we effectively leverage some of these publicly available applications or the source code for building different components of uh, the Speed API system? So uh, that's again um, that's we are looking into. Um, so so these are some of the open questions. Um, again, we can add more to this list. Um, so. Yeah, and uh, finally, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Leanne Clevenger, uh, Professor Red Davis, and and the especially and and this uh, SI2 uh, Titan Speed API satellite team for for help with this uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, thanks. So that's that's all. I think that's all I have. I think now um, we can take questions. Um. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Karen, Rich, and uh, Akhlesh. Um, uh, uh, Karen, do you want, do you have some wrap up slides or that's the presentation slides you guys have? Um, so that this concludes the uh, presentation slides that we've prepared. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no demo at this time as we uh -huh. uh, are still are still developing mm -hmm. an API specification. Uh, uh -huh. But I do see there are a number of questions in the chat session. So, David, perhaps you want to moderate those and we can yeah, have a sure. discussion. Uh, I guess uh, we can just go in you know, a top down process. You, you guys can see some questions, right? I guess. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, we do see a bunch of questions coming now. One of the questions, maybe. Uh, 
you know, from Pratika uh, is uh, are the data in the data warehouse Slack uh, uh, data warehouse or lake? Ooh, that's a new terminology. Data data lake. Interesting. Expected to be. Uh, can you see it as well? By the way, uh, I just have to find the question. Yes, I think it's we nine forty nine. It. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. At forty nine past the hour. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh -huh. Right. So basically, can it support more complicated data structure? Right? Whether it's mostly uh, tabular form or you know other more complicated the graph uh, data structure? Yeah, it's a great question. So. Okay. Sounds good. So Akilash, Rich, do you want yeah. to, one of you want to take that? Sure. Um, I can go ahead with that. Um, so yeah, there's no restriction on, 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 uh, the data that can be stored in a data warehouse or data lake. That's just a data warehouse that data lake, that's just a certain technology for storing, um, big amounts of data. Right. Um, so the speed API system, um, it, it, it is agnostic of, of the, the kind of data structure, uh, uh, that's that's what we envision. Um, a, so it's up to the end user how they would want to use that uh, data. So of course we encounter graph data structures and more complicated data structures in 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 EDA flows. So uh, there's no reason for restricting the Speed API system to only tabular uh, data structures. Okay. Also the other, the other question uh, does that answer your question? Um, and the second part is. Oh, by the way, yeah. At this time, uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, right? So um, it's it's fine, right? I don't know whether. Uh, yeah, that answered. Okay. Thanks, uh, Prati. Uh, so the second part of the question is also: Are there any sets of circuits being used as benchmarks or baselines? Uh, so this this comes back to the example use cases, right? Uh, so we are in the process of identifying some of these uh, example use cases um, and and see uh, how the Speed API system can be applied to those um, example use cases. Again, the idea with the Speed API system is is to create uh, uh, with these example use cases create um, so, uh, a data source, right? Uh, and and allow the Speed API system to to see uh, to access data from from that data source and see uh, how we can develop a useful application uh, AI ML application um, using this uh, speed API system and demonstrate um, um, the, the complete flow and how um, how it easy uh, makes the the flow development quite easy and, and solves a real uh, a, a, a problem um, and anything uh, you want to add pretty rich to this? Um, uh, just on the previous question with regards to the data format, tabular versus graph data, and I think from IBM's perspective, we would certainly want to make sure that we can support uh, underlying graph data formats yeah. that would be of particular interest to us so that we can make sure that the speed API is uh, going to play well with our own internal uh, databases and so forth that we've talked about in public forums like DAC. So yeah, I'm a big believer in being uh, database agnostic and making sure that there are reference implementations in place that establish that fact. Okay, the next question I think is from Karen Zhu. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. I have some high level questions. Uh, how do you think uh, uh, is, can academia participate in the efforts? Uh, yeah, I also have this question, right? So sure. will you expect the data to be made available to the public? And uh, also, you know, ultimately do you imagine, you know, for the EDA community, if people want to do machine learning, right? You know, the 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 uh, computer vision community has this image net, right? But, uh, you know, whether we have something like that for the ultimately with all this common data API and so on and so forth, a huge, much bigger amount of data can be available, uh, you know, in the EDA researcher community. So, um, yeah, what's your, uh, is that okay. your goal? And yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll get, the, I'll, get, 
Okay, I'll get the conversation kicked off. So I think on the first part of the question, how do you think academia can participate? This is a great opportunity to reflect back. Akilesh, you had a chart that had several key questions. Why don't you bring that up? Yeah, sure. And then we can have perhaps have a conversation around that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Open questions. So I think the starting point in terms of um, getting participation in these efforts is to, uh, if you have a strong opinion on these key open questions that Akilesh has mentioned, I think this is the time to make your opinion known. Um, mm -hmm. So I. Uh, uh, I think, as Akilesh mentioned, one of the, our goals in um, joining this session today is we wanted to get a conversation started uh, because it's. I would expect that within the next few months, there are kind of key architectural decisions that are going to be made. So I'll give you an example. Do we, does the speed API need to be REST based? Should that kind of be the core? element or should the speed API be Python based and then we can build REST APIs around that. Um, what level of security is most appropriate to implement in the speed API specification for an MVP? Um, I think another very, very important item is to identify, help to help to promote your use cases. So if you're in academia and you're saying to yourself, boy, I have a big problem right now in getting access to data for AI and ML applications. I think this is a working group that you want to be involved in because now this is your chance to define some standard ways of getting access to that data. And then we can have larger conversations around what are the right reference data sets, what's the right image net for EDA and so forth. How do we wrap the right APIs around that and so forth. So I hope hope that uh, some of these questions like what are the right use cases, are you uh, where in your academic endeavors are you having trouble getting access to data and therefore standardization would help. I think this is an excellent opportunity to, uh, to get involved. Now, um, in terms of nuts and bolts, there are a couple of questions in the direct message channel. Some folks reached out, hey, I'm in academia. I'd like to be involved with uh, some of this work. Uh, just to reiterate, I think that I believe it's the case that there is a no cost SI2 membership that's available. You do need to be an SI2 member to participate in a working group, but I think that can be done at no cost uh, for academic institutions. So we, we certainly welcome all comers. I would say that our working group right now is probably more tilted towards industry reps. We have many more industry reps than we do from academia. So here's your chance to shape the future and make sure that we hear more perspective from academia. So if folks are interested in getting involved in the speed API effort, please contact myself. I think um, my contact information as well as Rich and Akilesh's info uh, should be in the meeting materials for today. So please feel free to reach out and we can get you connected. Um, Rich, anything you wanna add to the just the overall question of uh, how folks can participate in these efforts? You covered all my comments, Kareem. <laughs> okay, Akilesh. Um, I think there was a there was a question on on uh, would the data be made available publicly, right? Uh, that that was a part of the question, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Um. So, um, am I correct, or or uh, so, so Dave, uh, Professor David was was that part of the question? Um, would oh. like I think. Uh, which yes. one? Are you talking? Yes, right. so there I found was a question. A... Are you doing in the sequential order, or you are kind of jumping yeah. at? Yeah. So there, I... there was, yeah, the second part of the question was: Will you expect the data will be made available to yeah. the public, like ImageNet? I think that's yeah. what you're yeah. searching oh, oh, yeah. for. Yeah, right, right. 
Yeah, there are also some. So the data currently, I think, all the EDA company data, they are proprietary data, but through some common API, it can still be interfaced, right? That's the current uh, vision you guys have, right? But meanwhile, uh, are you expecting some data be made available? Or later on, there's even some question like related to blockchain, right? So anyway, so you can maybe comment on this. You know, data is always the, the, the problem and the key, right? So I guess hopefully through this API, you can have easier data exchange or uh, stuff like that. Yeah, maybe that's a question. Yep. Okay. On the tech on. Sure. Okay. Um, do you want me to take that question frame first? Yeah, sure. If you yeah. would like to comment yeah. on that, please go ahead. So uh, again, uh, the, the data is is uh, proprietary, right? Uh, so lots of data will be proprietary, um, and again, it will depend upon upon the um, the, the EDA vendor or or the EDA supplier or or the design company, um, how much data they want to make it public, right? Um, because these APIs again, think think about uh, think think about this API system. Like if if I try to draw an analogy between let's say a um, a web application, right? So let's say you have uh, you have an um, Amazon account, right? So only some of the data, uh, so I have a personal um, account, right? So not all data can be made publicly available, right? Uh, so only certain data can be made publicly available, right? So so for example, um, um, uh, so it, it, again, it will it will depend upon upon um, uh, the the level of authentication the user has, right, to to access that data. Uh, so uh, what I would say is that what I would envision is that the data will be made uh, will will have restricted access in in many cases. Uh, only certain parts of data can be made publicly available. Again, that will depend upon upon the EDA supplier or or the the design company, right? Um, so the speed API system, yeah, it's it's uh, it will um, allow the um, um, the data source to have um, um, control over uh, the authentication, right? So which uh, which users will be authenticated to to access that data that that will again be be restricted uh, by the by the data source itself. Okay. So, King, uh, did I articulate that correctly, or like um, you want to add more to that? I think that's good. I did notice there's a few other questions in the chat, so maybe we'll. Make sure to cover those as well. Yeah. Yeah. I guess one of the question uh, is from Sayak, right? Uh, is it, uh, the Speed API spec uh, is it already publicly available, or you guys are still developing it? Or if it's not yet available, when do you expect uh, this to be made available? <laughs> Oh, I can take that one. So no, the speed API specification is still being developed. We're in the very early stages. So this is, uh, I'll just refer back to my earlier comments. This is your chance from an academic perspective to get involved and shape the specification. I, I expect the workflow will be as follows. Um, so right now we're identifying high priority use cases because quite frankly, I think it's going to be difficult to uh, develop an API specification completely in isolation without some problem or set of problems to be solved. So we're identifying those high priority use cases, identifying the data sets that go along with those use cases. And uh, upon the validation of the high priority use cases, I expect a specification will then be uh, written uh, with those use cases in mind. Uh, I don't remember, Rich and Akilesh, if we have a specific time frame that we're publicizing with regards to uh, this when a speed API v1.0 is expected. I know we've discussed some things internally, but I just don't recall uh, what the uh, uh, whether the plans are final at this point. Do you have any comments on time frame? Yeah, I agree, Kareem. Um, we're still in concept uh, for the standard. Uh, um, yeah, for the for the open standard, um, but but no roadmap has been published. 
So I, I completely agree. I think we're still at the stage where our working group has these open questions and we are certainly um, open to have others help us answer some of these. Okay, I also noticed right above there was a question on blockchain. Do you think it may face a point with blockchain? Um, so I'm not sure I've got the full question, but I think generally uh, is blockchain being considered as part of our uh, API discussions? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Akilash, you have some thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Um, so blockchain um, technology, that's, um, um, of course, uh, we, we, we started, uh, we, we talked a little bit about it from, from the angle of uh, uh, security, right? So that's, that's what uh, we have looked at. And again, the, I, I think there are, uh, the way we see it as, it, it as, um, we would want to um, ideally we would would want to leverage some of these uh, open um, or publicly available uh, applications. Uh, uh, whether it is a, let's say we are talking about a security component, right? So if there is a publicly available uh, uh, security component based on a blockchain technology, we can we will uh, possibly look look into into that as well. Uh, 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 for incorporating that into this PDPI system. So again, right now um, we are uh, we are in the initial phase of of coming up with the framework and and different components of of this framework. So blockchain technology, of course, uh, it's it's a very promising technology, and uh, and uh, we will definitely uh, talk about uh, about this technology um, in in our uh, discussions. So um, yeah. That's uh, that's my comment on on this. Uh, you you have uh, you have any like there, was there a specific question on on blockchain technology with respect to speed API? Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's our take on 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 uh, blockchain technology. Okay. Great. And if the person who posed the question has any follow-ups, they could let us know. Um, just in the meantime, there's a question on speed API. Uh, will this be open source under, let me read the question. Will the speed API be open source? If so, under what license? Are there copyright issues? Uh, there was a paper referenced in ASP deck that was based on open road. Okay. So, and start, let me start off the conversation in terms of licensing. Um, this is something that's very much under discussion right now. I'll give you my personal opinion on, uh, open source licensing and speed API. And that I personally think that the API specification should be completely open for anybody to use. It's hard to, uh, uh, imagine a specification being useful if it's closed and it's not open for everybody to at least see what the, what are the characteristics of the API. But the reference implementation, that particular piece of IP that's developed by the working group, that may be licensed under a slightly different model. So for example, if you want to use the reference implementation of the speed API that talks to OA and as a design database and some other uh, sets of uh, process data, your favorite EDA tool or your favorite open source EDA tool, well, those reference implementations may be open, available to, on a membership basis. Uh, those may, I think, more typically be distributed to SI2 members. And as I said, I think academic institutions have a no cost uh, option to join SI2. So I see a little bit of a distinction between the API specification and the software, which realizes a reference implementation to some specific databases. You know, one, the first probably should be completely open. And the second, at least in my opinion, may be, may end up being open, you know, open source, but with membership associated with it. 
Um, Rich, Akilash, I know we've talked a lot about licensing models, so I just gave my personal opinion. If you have different personal opinions, uh, feel free to chime in. Well, I, yeah, Graham, I, I think that's that's uh, um, that's my personal opinion too. That uh, the the specification should be uh, should be open. Um, again, again, we are we are still in discussion phase. Um, uh, but but I, I do believe that uh, uh, the specifications should be made open um, so that uh, it becomes usable or or um, more many um, end users start using uh, such an open specification, right? So um, or or developing their data sources compliant with uh, that open specification, right? Um, the API specification. So <clears throat> and and that will make it more useful, right? The uh, uh, the, the speed API system will, will become more useful in, in, in that sense. Uh, but I agree as uh, as a working group, if uh, we develop um, a reference implementation um, for let's say specific use cases, um, then um, they may not be uh, uh, completely open source, right? They may be uh, accessible only to a restricted group of uh, uh, members. Sure, and I think some someone was trying to ask a question. Oh, it's okay. We can. Uh, we still have more questions in the chat, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone, right? If you still have question, please feel free to type in the chat, right? And uh, uh, we can even extend this. Uh, we have another talk at ten thirty. Uh, in the past, right? We can even extend some of this uh, question and answer in the through the chat or even past the hour, right? So just feel free to just enter your question into the chat. I do see a question for the uh, 3D and the two and a half D, right? Do you expect that your speed API will cover that? Or any challenges? So, so the, uh, the 2.5D and 3D I see, um, domain uh, so that's a separate satellite team and and they are trying to develop uh their own um roadmap uh but in terms of um but but in in terms of uh using the data sources from 2.5d and 3d ic um i i don't see any any um reason why speed api system cannot be used uh for uh 2.5d and 3d ic uh data source so if uh those flows, uh, they create a data source uh, in in, a, in 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 whatever format, and they are speed API compliant. Uh, then uh, the speed API system can definitely provide uh, access to that uh, process data. So again, uh, remember the speed API system is is only trying to deal with uh, process data from um, from EDA flows or uh, silicon to system design flows, right? So as long as the data source is, is compliant with the with the speed API system, then uh, this 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 uh, specification can be applied to uh, to any any data source. Okay, and there's a question I saw that I thought you would be in a very good position to address, at least on behalf of your own company, Akilash. Are EDA vendors on board with the use case model? So I know you can't speak for vendors in particular, but uh, maybe you want to say a few words on behalf of ANSYS? Um, oh, okay. Yes. Um, uh, EDA vendors, so slide nine, I think uh, we were yeah. talking about, yeah. Um, so definitely um, we, um, as, as ANSYS, we support um, um, the Speed API um, system, right? Um, and then that's why um, we are leading, um, we are working on, on, on this um, Speed API satellite team, right? So, um, and, and, and this is, this is the, uh, so as, as, as a group, uh, this SI the satellite team um this is this is our vision right so the use case model where um different EDA suppliers uh if if they become compliant with the speed API system that um that would definitely be the the best case scenario for for the end user right for their AIML application 
Um, are there EDM, are other EDM vendors on board? Um, that's hard to say for me. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but, but you are an EDM vendor, right? You are on board, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so we, we, we are definitely, um, we are definitely on board uh, with this, and that's why we are participating in in this effort. Yeah. So the the, the follow up question, I think there is this uh, there is a metrics two point one definition and implementation. So yeah, this is very interesting. I think uh, we did uh, we have looked into um, metrics two point one, and in fact. Um, Professor Andrew Kang actually gave a presentation in, in our um, uh, uh, AIML SIG on, on metrics 2.1. And uh, so, yeah, this is a public data set and, and uh, available, so uh, part of Open Road project, right? Um, so, uh, and Open Road has got a lot of public data sets available, right? So uh, we are looking into, into that data set as well, the open, um, the, the PDM optimization problem, that's also uh, part of that open road project. And um, that was one of the reasons uh, we started to look into that example because we have uh, the data source available um, over there, right? Um, publicly publicly on the open road GitHub. So, but uh, commenting on, on the metrics 2.1, um, this is more of uh, standardizing um, um, the data format, right? Um, and um, so I, I believe this, this provides a standard way of, of um, um, specifying different, um, uh, different types of data, right? I think uh, various kinds of data. So, um, so that's just a, a way of standardizing the data and, and which is great actually. Um, and, um, but, but the speed API system um, essentially allow, what we envision is it will essentially allow the end user to write queries uh, for interfacing with uh, various data sources, right? And and um, it may not, the, the responses uh, from um, these queries, they may not be um, in, in a, let's say a, in, in, uh, in a metrics 2.1 um, format, right? That's again, that's what we need to um, work on, right? Um, decide how, how the responses will look like, right? Um, so in, in that sense, the speed API system is, is slightly, um, um, a, um, it is essentially trying to interface with, with the, with the data sources. Right. And, um, so that's, that's going, um, beyond the simply specifying the data formats for, um, various, uh, EDA process data. So, um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, do you? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I see we're at the bottom of the hour. I just want to acknowledge there were several direct messages. Folks had a few comments and offers to sync up for further discussion. I think I've responded to each one that was sent to me, just in case I missed a DM, uh, please uh, reach out to me again in the Zoom chat, and I'll make sure to connect with you uh, appropriately, yeah. um, assuming we need to move on to the next presentation. So David, on behalf of all the co-presenters, deep appreciation for the invitation to present today and all of the excellent conversation and questions. I really hope that uh, we can use this as a starting point for further discussion with academia so you can all help to uh, set us off on the right course here. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh, Karen, Rich, and uh, Aklesh. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Right? Uh, if you guys can stay a little bit, uh, and in case there is some chat private sure. message to you, right? So you can have some uh, further discussion. But with all that, uh, thanks, thanks again. Right? Uh, really excellent talk and uh, a lot of great uh, questions uh, and answers. Uh, thank you very much. Right? Um, now let me move on. We are going to, actually our next speaker is here. Uh, let me see. All right, so um, you guys can see my screen, right? Yes, we can see. Everything good? All right, so 
Yeah, our next talk uh, is related with the first one, also, you know, API and the standardization. But meanwhile, this is the effort uh, driven by IEEE CEDA. Uh, there's a design automation, uh, some, some working technical working group, right? So uh, the talk is related to how to establish research foundations for ML enabled EDA and IC design. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Jin Wu Jun. Uh, he's a research staff member at IBM, uh, TJ Watson Research Center. At IBM, he has uh, been working to advance design methodologies for AI hardware accelerators and high performance microprocessors, and uh, leveraging definitely machine learning and also cloud. You know, cloud is everywhere now, right? So he received his PhD in uh, EE from KAIST. So, uh, Jin Wu. So the floor is yours. Okay, um, let me I try share to share my screen. My screen. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. So you can kick me out. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. While you are uh, loading your uh, PowerPoint, everything. So um, just a general logistics, right? Uh, please type your questions in the chat and uh, uh, mute yourself, right? So we are not going to do question and answer uh, during the talk, right? So, okay, Jingwu, thanks. Okay, um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, hello, my name is Jinwook Zhang and I'm from IBM Research uh, in Yorktown Heights here in New York. Um, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me to this seasonal school program. And it's really a great pleasure to present our CEDA DATC activities here. Um, so uh, I'm actually serving as the chair of IEEE CEDA DATC uh, starting last year. Uh, the, the DATC is the Design Automation Technical Committee under IEEE CEDA. And my presentation today is entitled, um, as shown in this slide, the IEEE CEDA DATC, uh, Establishing the Research Foundations for IC Physical Design and Machine Learning Enabled EDA. So actually, the, my presentation consists of three parts today. Um, at first, I'm going to overview the DATC activities uh, to establish and expand the research foundations for IC physical design and machine learning CAD. And after that, uh, I will describe a little bit more uh, further detail of our two activities in the following parts. So in part two, uh, I will present DATC robust design flow, uh, which is an academic reference design flow, uh, which ha we have been working on since 2016. And in part three, then I will describe our efforts toward cloud native enablements for large scale design of experiments, uh, for especially for machine learning enabled EDA. So um, let's actually get started. Uh, so here's the part one. And I'd like to start with an introduction about what is the DETC, what is the Design Automation Technical Committee. So uh, it is a member technical committee of so IEEE CEDA. Um, IEEE CEDA, the Council on EDA, actually has several committees as shown here, and DATC is uh, one of them. And here's our mission statement. Uh, we were originally established to investigate the um, current topical issues of EDA. And with that purpose, uh, we have been working to produce publicly available design flows and test cases and also we want to arrange discussion forums for the current EDA issues. And currently we have three members, uh, myself, uh, Jin Hyuk Jung from IBM Research and Professor Andrew Kang from UCSD and Professor Red Davis from NCSU. So recently um, we DATC have been working to establish and expand the research foundations for IC physical design and ML enabled EDA. And there are actually a couple of DATC activities around this goal. Um, first, uh, we work to establish an academic reference design flow, uh, which preserve the leading research codes and tools. And secondly, uh, we work to define a standardized metric system for flow measurement. And our activities also include some golden calibration data sets, um, data set build uh, for electrical analysis and verification tasks. And we also work to create modern and complete benchmarks for physical design research. And finally, uh, we are also trying to enable a cloud native enablement for large scale uh, distributed design of experiments. So in the rest of part one, uh, I will go over all these five activities one by one and introduce what we are doing under DATC these days. So let's start from the academic reference design flow. 
So um, the academic reference design flow uh, created by IEEE at DATC, uh, it's called DATC Robust Design Flow, uh, RDF for short. And it was initiated in 2016 uh, based on the winning tools from the previous uh, uh, CAT contest, like ICCAT contest or ISPD contest. And with this uh, RDF development, uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to preserve the leading research codes and tools in kind of archives to shape. And we also want to uh, foster flow scale research uh, by composing the flow around those uh, research outcome. And the diagram below, uh, diagram shown here, is actually the entire design flow supported in, in the RDF, uh, which includes the Scala, Chisel, the RTL generation, and the RTL obfuscation, which is a kind of logic locking step. We also have the logic synthesis, uh, we have the DFT insertion flow, as well as the full PNR flow supported by the open road or some point hole based flow as shown here. And this table uh, shows all the tools uh, that are currently included in the RDF's inventory. And the tools uh, with highlighted with the um, yellow background color are the previous CAD contest winning tools. I, I think you can see that some famous tools like NTU Place and Fast Place or the um, Fast Route or Dr. Koo. And the other tools highlighted with the um, red phones here are the um, latest update uh, we have made in the past year. So as you can see in this uh, table and in this slide, um, the ATC RDF's inventory kind of preserve the leading research code and reading uh, research outcomes, as well as the MCAT contest outcomes. And it's also continuously expanding. And among the latest updates, uh, I want to particularly highlight the new automatic macro placer uh, in the next slide. So uh, this is actually our this year's update. So this year we have included a recent automatic macro placer called um, RTLMP in the RTL RTF inventory. And this RTLMP macro pro placer provides human quality macro placement solution uh, by combining its key components such as auto clustering, shaping, pin access comprehension, and notch region avoidance. And it also has many other key features. And we also have included a newer version of RTLMP in the RT RDF's inventory, uh, which is named Higher RTLMP. So again, it is, it's an updated version of RTLMP, especially to support for the um, large scale designs having a large number of macros. So on top of RTLMP, uh, the Higher RTLMP leverages logical hierarchy and data flow of the design and creates a multi-level physical hierarchy. So based on that, uh, it uses a two-step cluster shaping process uh, for improved runtime and quality of results. So this plus uh, shows the actual result uh, obtained by the higher RTL MP execution, uh, which is for the um, a complex AI accelerator called Tabular under 02. And this AI accelerator actually has 760 macros, which is a huge number. But as you can see here, even if there's large number of macros, the higher RTLMP tool can create a nice macro placement uh, for such a big design. Okay, so next, um, I'll, I'd like to introduce our activities uh, to establish a standardized metric system for flow measurement, uh, which is metrics 2.1. So uh, the motivation of this activity is from the lack of standard tool metrics and reporting formats in the EDA domain. So as we all know, uh, there are many, many academic and commercial EDA tools, but each tool uses its own naming conventions, metrics format, and perimeter naming. So we, we think that such uh, divergence hampers or prevents the sharing of EDA knowledge as well as the um, reproduction of results. So um, we DATC uh, have been working and supporting to establish a generalized metrics collection system named Metrics 2.1, which is shown here. So Metrics 2.1 uh, provides a standard format for flow metrics data, and it defines a robust structure for large scale metrics data set. And we also have created this GitHub repository uh, shown here. And this repository uh, provides a metrics data set uh, obtained from the open road design flow execution uh, on the public enablements. 
And this repository also has several Jupyter notebooks, uh, which demonstrate the example machine learning applications using uh, the Metrics 2.1 metric system. And the Metrics 2.1 system is now actually included in the um, latest releases of OpenRoad and OpenRoad Flow scripts. Uh, so users now can specify uh, this dash metrics argument with the file name. Then after the flow execution, uh, the open road will generate the metrics JSON file the, at the end of the flow execution. And this shows an example metrics data for the detailed routing. So you can see that some detailed routing metrics are recorded as kind of JSON objects, uh, essentially a key value pair. And this is the metrics naming convention. Uh, each matrix is in the metrics 2.1, uh, each metric is uniquely defined by the stage and category and name as well as the um, modifier. So now I will explain the DATC efforts for calibration data sets. Um, so first, uh, why, why we are doing this? Um, so so um, in open source EDA context, so what we have seen is that um, so we, we, we saw that the open enablements are only as good as how they are being used. So what does that mean? Um, sometimes we see that the open enablements cannot guarantee the best accuracy or required accuracy due to the lack of strong regression process or strong or thorough validation processes. So here's an example uh, showing two different uh, open RCX usages for Sky 130, uh, one from the open road and the other from an open lane flow. So this plot shows the open road data and this plot shows the open load, open lane data. And the first plot is the resistance data and the second plot is the, K, uh, the capacitance data. And this uh, plus individual plot actually compares the um, uh, the data obtained from the open road fl flow execution against the um, Sky 130 golden enablement. So you, you can you can see that the open road RC data uh, is actually very well correlated with the um, Sky 130 golden enablement. Uh, this is because the open road flow is very well calibrated to the golden enablement data. But on the other hand, um, if you see the right plot here. Then the RC expression data obtained from the open lane flow doesn't really correlate very well. Uh, it has some offset from the Sky 130 golden enablement data. So we think that uh, this kind of highlights the um, necessity of the calibration efforts in the open source EDA context. So in, in other words, uh, we need to calibrate the open source enablement and tools to obtain the reliable, reliable results from those, those enablement and tools. So uh, with that motivation, uh, we DATC have been working to establish a calibration repository, which is shown here. So the repository provides a reference uh, analysis data for STA, the static uh, timing analysis, RC extraction, and IR drop analysis. And the calibration data sets were generated from the design rule violation free uh, routed data cases, routed test cases uh, from the open uh, enablements. Mm -hmm. enablements. And we currently uh, provide 39 cases in our data set. Um, so based on this effort, uh, we hope that our data sets uh, facilitate the um, calibration in the um, open source enablement and open source EDA domain. So now I'll explain uh, our fourth activity, uh, which is the modern and complete benchmarks for physical design. So first, the um, classical benchmark revitalization. Um, there, as you already know, um, there have been several classical benchmarks from CAD contests, uh, but they are either outdated or incomplete. Uh, for example, there have been used uh, people will people have been using the ISPD placement benchmarks, uh, which are written in bookshare format, which is very old format, and those uh, bookshare format doesn't have um, no, uh, the cell type. It doesn't have timing information, and it also has it also doesn't have technology information. So under DATC activities, uh, we have supported this uh, development of uh, Rosetta Stone tool, which is a bookshelf to laptop converter. So given a bookshelf based benchmark and PDK information, the, Ro the Rosetta Stone tool creates an open DB database. And then uh, the tool uh, populates the missing information such as cell type, routing tracks, 
and then it resizes the macro blocks uh, properly based on the technology information. So GitHub link shown here provides the 35 benchmarks in four open enablements. So users can create the um, um, full benchmark format using the Rosetta Stone tool based on the classical benchmark, uh, which is the ISPD or I, uh, ICCAD bookshelf based formats. So um, these two plots show some example data, which are obtained from one uh, ISPD05 benchmark, which is Adaptec1 benchmark case. And the other is ISPD06 benchmark, which is SuperVlu18. And these two benchmarks were converted to NANgate45 technology using this Rosetta Stone tool. So you, you can see that the Rosetta Stone tool uh, successfully converts the um, pre previous bookshelf-based contest benchmarks into the um, NANgate45 technology. So it kind of revitalized the um, classical CAD contest benchmarks for the um, full flow uh, research, full flow research. And uh, we actually, uh, while developing the Rosetta Stone, uh, we actually found the um, uh, the converted benchmarks have kind of impractically, impractically long timing path. And we, to cope with this problem, uh, the Rosetta Stone provides a kind of logic path cutting capability. So users can kind of specify the maximum path length constraints as, as an input to the Rosetta Stone tool. Then using the OpenSTA API, the Rosetta Stone retrieves the timing path of the design and insert flip-flops and transform the nail list uh, properly. So this table shows the result. Uh, so these two columns show the um, uh, original results before the logic cutting. And you can see that all the design has kind of very large logic stages. For example, um, this design has thousands of logic stages having the large and very long path delay at the end. And with the logic cutting capability, uh, we can see that the logic stage and the um, path delay are now in a kind of uh, very reasonable shapes. And I also would like to introduce one more uh, benchmark activity under the ATC, uh, which is the macro placement uh, benchmark enablement. Uh, uh, macro placement is an important challenge uh, for physical design and machine learning enabled EDA, and it's these days very popular. But we haven't really seen an established foundation or established research foundation for this macro placement research. So under the TILOS AI Institute, uh, Professor Andrew Kang's team at UCSD have been establishing uh, this macro placement repository, uh, which is shown in this slide. And this repository provides a modern uh, macro placement benchmarks as well as the related research foundations. So the repository includes the um, three well-known uh, open source designs, Area and Risk 5 CPUs, Mempool, Many Core System, and NVDLA um, Deep Learning Accelerators. And it supports the three open source enablement uh, with SRAM generators. And it also provides um, three different imp three uh, implementation flow, uh, including two commercial cadence-based flow, as well as one open road-based flow. So with this uh, macro placement repository, um, uh, we, we hope that uh, this macro placement repository kind of facilitates the um, machine learning enabled, uh, enabled macro placement research. For example, uh, with this macro placement repository, uh, using the research foundation provided by this repository, uh, we can study kind of a machine learning guided macro placement research uh, utilizing uh, all this uh, research offering. So actually um, the cost function of the um, higher RTLMP macro placer, which is included in this repository, has uh, several tunable parameters, such as wait for area and wait for while length and wait for some penalty factors. And, but uh, it's very difficult to define, very difficult to determine the optimal weights for individual factors uh, given the design. So we think that we can kind of utilize the um, hyperparameter tuning methods to find optimal weights in the cost function for different design. And that could be one interesting research, research direction and another thing we can do with this uh, macro placement repository is the uh, machine learning driven macro placement research. So the macro placement repository actually provides a baseline implementation of the famous RL based macro placer from uh, Google. And the picture shown here indeed uh, were obtained from the um, baseline uh, implementation of the Google RL based macro placer. 
So, and users can see the, all the uh, source code and all the enablement in that repository. So with this uh, macro placement repository, uh, we want to provide a research foundation for macro placement research. And we also want to facilitate the uh, machine learning enabled um, macro placement research uh, based on this effort. So um, I also, so finally, I will briefly introduce the cloud native enablement of large scale DOE. So again, uh, why do we need this? Um, we all know that the machine learning requires data and the same applies to the machine learning CAD research. Um, however, the generating the large amount of data for ML CAD needs huge amount of compute resources and it takes significant time. So we want to establish an efficient way of generating the large amount of data for MLCAD. And here, uh, we DATC would like to utilize the cloud computing resources. Um, but now the question becomes how we can best utilize the public cloud services uh, to generate large data, um, especially for machine learning EDA. Um, I, I think in, in a simplest manner, uh, we can just obtain the bare cloud instances and install libraries and packages there and compile our tools and execute the um, flow every time we need the experiments. But obviously, it won't scale very well, and it's just the same as what we do usually with our on-prem machines. So in that sense, uh, we need to establish a generic and cloud way of enabling the large scale uh, experiments on cloud. So this is kind of a cloud architecture that uh, we think is suitable for large scale DOE. So to realize the cloud native enablement, uh, we utilize the containerization technology, uh, which is a proven way of building the cloud native application. So for that matter, um, we have created a custom container images for flow and tool execution. We also have a persistent volume resources, resources uh, to retain PDK and libraries. And this environment is hosted on Kubernetes cluster and individual experiments are distributed using Ray framework. And since uh, this is a real cloud native enablement, uh, we can host this architecture anywhere in public cloud, like AWS, Azure, GCP, and IBM Cloud, and even in local machines. So um, these are our activities, uh, although they are, uh, although there was, uh, although I just gave very short introductions, uh, but these are our activities toward um, research foundations for IC physical design and machine learning enabled EDA. Um, uh, in short, uh, we DATC uh, work to establish an academic reference design flow and we define standardized metrics system, and we build uh, calibration data sets, and we create modern benchmarks, and we also work to establish a cloud-based uh, large-scale experiments. So um, in the following two parts of my presentation, I will kind of deep dive a little bit further about the, uh, the design flow and the cloud enablement. So here's the part two, uh, the ATC robust design flow. Okay, so uh, we actually went over the DATC RDF's overview in part one, and this was the slide uh, that I presented in the previous part. But in this part, uh, I'd like to give a little bit more details about the actual flow in the DATC RDF, uh, uh, which is shown here. So DATC RDF flow starts from a pure Verilog design or chisel generate Verilog. And the RTL can be also optionally obfuscated using the RTL obfuscation tool. Then logic synthesis follows. Uh, it is performed using Yosis with ABC engine, and we do the DFT insertion on the synthesized nail list. And for PNR, uh, RDF includes the open road integrated application uh, as well as the point tool based uh, RDF flow. So let me describe the individual flow components in the following uh, set of slides. So first, uh, I will describe chisel and hardware generators. Um, chisel is a, a kind of open source domain specific hardware design language uh, written in Scala. Um, it consists of a set of special classes, uh, predefined objects, uh, language conventions uh, for facilitating the agile hardware design. And with Chisel, uh, it is very easy to write highly configurable hardware generators uh, utilizing the func functional programming features of Scala language. 
And here is the uh, minimal example of what Chisel code looks like. Uh, the syntax itself is just a pure Scala language uh, because it's built uh, on top of the Scala. And you can see here that Chisel supports some configurable class definition with inheritance. And in this way, Chisel supports highly configurable hardware generation in very efficient manner. And because of this uh, efficient hardware generation and the highly configurable generation, Chisel has been obtaining substantial interest from hardware architecture researchers uh, who want uh, fast and agile, agile architecture exploration. And there are many open source Chisel designs because of that, uh, include, which includes RISC-V rocket chip generator, Gemini deep learning accelerator, and Huacha vector processor, just, just um, to name but a few. And with Chisel enablement, um, we can use the uh, recent processor and accelerator designs for flow research. And now the RTL obfuscation in DATC RDF. Um, so the DATC RDF flow includes the RTL obfuscation tool, which is a logic technique, logic locking technique, and the tool is called Assure. And it is an RTL obfuscated framework, assuming a Nellist only thread model. And this diagram illustrates the, um, the entire Azure obfuscation flow. So given an RTL design and secret locking key, as well as the tool parameters, the Azure tool generates the um, obfuscated RTL design at the end. And uh, Azure actually use, uses some, uh, uh, uses three obfuscation techniques, uh, which are the um, constant obfuscation, operation obfuscation, and the um, branch obfuscation. So then uh, after the logic uh, locking, uh, we can run the logic synthesis in the RDF, uh, which is done by the famous Yosis and ABC. So in RDF, uh, on top of the famous Yosis, Yosis and ABC engine, uh, we have further incorporated the latest ABC update, uh, which is tight integration of set server with internal design representation. So um, thanks to this, ABC has now better scalability and new options for better technology mapping quality. And this screenshot uh, um, demonstrates the um, example of the such improved scalability. Um, it shows the um, equivalent checking runtime of two large neural network design. And you can see that the new ABC is about 10x faster than the previous. And we the synthesis script in RDF also include the um, lazy man synthesis scripts. And it uses a database of logic rewriting choices, uh, which were empirically discovered in the previous the synthesis runs. And the, with, uh, with this kind of learned data, uh, we can reduce the optimize, optimization runtime uh, significantly uh, while enabling the more uh, accurate assessment of logic transformations and so better quality. And after logic synthesis, uh, we insert the EFT logic uh, in the open source EDA ecosystem. There has not been a usable DFT solution until recently, but Thanks to the release of the four tool chain, uh, the TCRDF now includes the um, DFT support support in its inventory. So the given uh, a gate level nail list, uh, the four tool chain uh, creates a scan chain by adding test signals, scan chain and JTAG test in interface. And it also creates compressed uh, test pattern uh, through its ATPG flow. So these are the PNR flow in DATC RDF now. Um, RDF includes the open road tool for PNR. So it is now a very famous open source tool so that supports the um, complete RTL to GDS flow. And open road, open road is based on the industry standard format, uh, such as LeftDev and Liberty. And, and so it enables a robust design enablement in DATC RDF. And this is the um, overall open road flow. And the blue box shown in this uh, diagram is the, all the flow components integrated into a single binary. And the integrated application has more than 20 tools uh, from flow planning to global routing. And all tools can be invoked using the um, tickle commands from the binary. And open road also has a Qt based GUI, uh, which is shown in the right figure here. And you can see that the layout is visualized in the GUI window, which is a very nice feature. And also there is an uh, interactive terminal as well. And RDF also has another PNR flow uh, composed with the uh, academic point tools, which are basically the, um, Kate, uh, the CAT contest outcomes or winning tools. 
And the purpose of this flow is uh, to pre uh, uh, first, uh, we want to preserve the leading research code into kind of a flow shape. And we also want to foster a uh, flow scale research based on uh, such enablement. And the pointer-based PNR flow takes a flow definition file, uh, which is described in YAML format shown in uh, this slide. Then it composes the PNR flow accordingly and generates the design outcomes as shown here. So uh, how to use this uh, DATCRDF? Um, DATCRDF consists of flow collateral and tool binaries. And the flow collateral, which includes flow scripts, PDK libraries, and example designs is provided in the GitHub repository shown in this page. And the compiled tool binaries included in the DATCRDF flow are provided as a single Docker image. And this is the script to install and launch the DATCRDF. Uh, we can just clone the DATCRDF repository, which has the all the flow collateral using the typical git clone command. And then we can launch the DATCRDF using the Docker run command uh, pointing the uh, DATC RDF uh, Docker image. So uh, let me actually show you a demo video of the DATC RDF. Um, in the demo video, uh, I will first demonstrate uh, how to generate RTL uh, using an example chisel design. Uh, then I will show you the RTL obfuscation uh, logic synthesis using UCS uh, DFT insertion with Vault, and finally PNR with Open Road tools. So here is the demo video. In this demo, I will show you how to use DATC RDF. So first installation, uh, we clone the DATC RDF GitHub repository first, uh, which has all the flow, flow collector data. And this is the GitHub link. And I will use typical Git commands to, to install all the flow collector data from the GitHub repository. So once it's cloned, uh, we can now launch the DATC RDF. DATC RDF is actually provided as a Docker image, and this is a Docker hub link. So we can launch the container from the image from the image as follows. Uh, you can see this Docker run command, which takes this Docker image, which is taken from this Docker hub URL. So we run this command in the terminal. Then you can notice that the terminal prompt has changed it to the Docker uh, containers prompt. So the Docker container is now running. And we check the installation of all the tools using this command. So we see that the SPT for chisel, Azure for RT obfuscation, Yosis uh, for synthesis, Vault for DFT insertion, and OpenNode PNR. So all the tools are available in the Docker container for DATC RDF. Now let's move on to the RTL generation uh, with chisel. So for this demo, we used RISC-V mini-core, uh, which is a three-stage pipeline fully written in Chisel, and this is a GitHub link. And to generate the RTL of this design, uh, we run the following command. So basically, we clone the GitHub repository and get into there and run the make command. So I will copy this command and run that command in the terminal. So now the RTL generation has completed and the generated RTL of this RISC-V mini core is located at this directory. And you can, we can see that there's a very low file generated by the chisel. So now let's move on to the RTL obfuscation using the Azure tool. Uh, for obfuscation, we first need to generate a secret key. Uh, so I will use this command in the terminal. Then you can see that a secret key file is generated for use. So we, then we run the Azure tool to get the obfuscated design. So here's the command. Uh, we give the secret input key to the Azure tool and also the RTL file, which was generated by the chisel. So we run this Azure command in the terminal. So once completed, uh, we can check the Azure output file, which are here. And the Verilog file, the obfuscated design Verilog files are located here. And we will use this Verilog file for logic synthesis. So let's move on to the logic synthesis. For logic synthesis, we use OpenRoad flow make file. So first we create the workspace and copy the OpenRoad flow make file there. Then we create the SDC file which has clock period constraints. 
So we just create a single command for particular setting. Now we create the design config file, which is input for the open world Google make file. So in the config file, uh, we see the design name and the platform information, which is Sky130 PDK and library. And the very log files and SDC file paths are also specified in the clear and config file. And we also see the design parameters shown here. So we create the design config file using this command. Then now we can run the synthesis flow using the open world make file command. So we use this command to run the UCS logic synthesis. So the logic synthesis has now completed and we can check the gate level nail list in this path. And you can see that the gate level nail list is available here. So now let's move on to the DFT insertion. So for DFT, we use both tool and both need to know the DFF cell name. So we specify the library file name and the DFF cell name. Then we use the both chain command, which takes clock input name and reset input port name and library information. And finally, the gate level nail list file. So we use this command to run the fault chain command. So once completed, the DFT inserted nail list is available at this directory. And we want to use this file as the input to the PNR flow. So we first move the Yosis output as the different name and use the fault output as the synthesis output. So now we move on to the PNR flow. So we use open road flow and actually we already have the open road flow make file. So we can just run the make command to launch the open road PNR. So the PNR flow has now completed. So we close the container and check the results. And all the results are stored in the workspace directory. And we can check the log messages from this directory. And all the research files are here. And finally, we can also see the re report file from open roads. And I also note that uh, the open road flow also saves the layout images in the reports directory. And there are basically four reports file, the report images, the final layout, placement, cluster synthesis, and reside instances. So we can pull out the images using these Python scripts. So if I run this Python script, then we can check the layout images. Okay, so that was the um, demonstration of the RDF. Uh, I, I hope everybody <laughs> enjoyed the demo video. So that, now let me quickly summarize the part two. So um, uh, DHC RDF is the academic reference design flow uh, developed by DHC. And our goal is that uh, we want to preserve the leading research codes in a complete design flow. And we also would like to foster the flow scale optimization research. And in this part, uh, we have also walked through the DATC RDF flow in more detail, uh, which includes the um, RTL generation with chisel and RTL obfuscation with Assure and logic synthesis and DFT insertion with fault and PNR. So this concludes part two. And now part three, uh, the cloud enablement of large scale design of experiments. So uh, again, um, this was the slide that I had in part one and to establish efficient way of generating large amount of data for machine learning enabled EDA, uh, we DATC would like to bring attention to the cloud computing. But now, like I said before, uh, now the question becomes uh, how to best utilize the public cloud services to generate large data, especially for machine learning CAD in a cloud native way. So in this part, um, we will learn how to deploy large scale design of experiments on cloud using Docker, Kubernetes, Ray, and public cloud services. And this diagram is what we will learn throughout this part of my presentation. So it is a, a Kubernetes cluster architecture, which we think is uh, suitable for large scale uh, experiments. However, um, you may not be familiar with all these terminologies, uh, such as Kubernetes, PaaS, or Ray, or PVC, or PV here. So in the rest of part three, so we start by reviewing the basic uh, knowledge or basic terminologies uh, to understand the Kubernetes cluster architecture. 
Uh, then I will show you a simplified version of the Kubernetes architecture first uh, for uh, suitable for design experiments using the DHC RDF. Then uh, we scale out uh, this Kubernetes architecture to multi-container cluster. And finally, a multi-node, multi-container multi cluster running on public cloud services. So first, uh, what is Docker and container? Um, Docker is a software platform uh, which creates an application into so-called container. And container is a software package uh, which contains the application and its all its dependencies uh, to run that application. And it isolates different applications uh, from each other uh, while sharing the same OS kernel. And to understand the benefit of container, uh, let, let us compare different types of applications. Um, this diagram shows a traditional uh, binary kind of uh, application structure uh, where the applications and their dependencies exist separately. However, in this traditional structure, it is very difficult to run applications having totally different uh, dependencies. And so to cope with this problem in 2000s, uh, we used this virtual machine-based applications. But such application, um, this kind of VM-based application includes the entire whole OS. And so it is very difficult to get past the uh, latency issues and the performance issues. Uh, meaning that uh, they may suffer from the significant performance overhead. And this is the structure of the containerized application, um, similar to the um, virtual machine-based application. A containerized application comes with all its dependencies, but now uh, it does not include the full OS, uh, the big chunk of the OS, but it only has the um, necessary part of the OS kernel. So the latency and performance issue of the virtual machine-based application uh, can be resolved. And when we package an application using Docker and make it usable as a container, um, the application is called Docker image. And such Docker images uh, are executed by the Docker runtime. And here is an example of creating and running the Docker image and container. So um, to create a Docker image, uh, we first write a Docker file and run the Docker build command uh, as shown here. So the uh, Docker file contains all the information about the application, uh, which includes the base image or base OS and dependency installation and build commands and all the necessary files, as well as the environment variables. So it's kind of complete description of the whole application landscape, um, including all the dependencies and OS and the uh, files and the environment variables. And the created Docker image uh, can be run by the Docker run command as shown here. And now um, I introduce the Kubernetes and container orchestration. Um, as I described, uh, Docker builds and runs the containers and now Kubernetes, on the other hand, provides a kind of container orchestration services. So we use uh, Kubernetes uh, to deploy, manage, and scale out the containers on large-scale compute infrastructure. So uh, what Kubernetes does is uh, Kubernetes kind of abstracts the underlying compute infrastructure, uh, which can be on-premise data center, local server, or public cloud services, or even mixture of those. And thanks to this uh, abstraction of the cloud, uh, compute environment, uh, Kubernetes provides a standard and generic way of deploying the containerized applications. And here are a few key terminologies uh, used in Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes world. And in Kubernetes, a node uh, means a compute machine, uh, such as physical server or virtual machine or a cloud instance. And a set of nodes uh, that are grouped together is called cluster. And pod uh, is a construct for running container in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it provides an isolated environment uh, to run containers in a node. And in Kubernetes, uh, storage resources are also abstracted uh, by the persistent volume concept. Uh, in other words, a persistent volume uh, is an external storage available in cluster, uh, such as local directory, network file system, and cloud file storage. 
And once we have this persistent volume, and to use the persistent volume in part, we need this uh, persistent volume claim, uh, PVC for short. And we can consider PVC as a ticket to authorize a part to use PV as, a, as its storage. So here's the minimal Kubernetes cluster architecture. Um, it includes a single node, uh, kind of a single computer or single machine, uh, which can be a local machine or well, your laptop as well, or your server. And in practice, uh, we also create a user namespace uh, to make it easier to manage all the Kubernetes uh, resources. And since we also need a storage for our data, uh, such as PDK libraries and design collateral data, uh, we have to create a volume. And in other words, we have to create persistent volume and persistent volume claim, uh, which are associated with our local storage, which has the um, PDK library and design data. Uh, then uh, we have a single pod uh, running the container. Uh, in this example, the DATC RDF Docker container. Then with this Kubernetes cluster, uh, we can now launch our design of experiments by submitting the job to the um, RDF container. So um, then how can we actually create the cluster and use it? Uh, this was just the um, uh, diagram. So we, I want to just show you the real example running this Kubernetes cluster, which runs the RDF Docker container inside. So in the next slide, uh, I will show you a demo video about how to create the minimal Kubernetes cluster and how to run the DAC RDF flow there. So here's the demo video. In this demo, I will show you how to set up a Kubernetes cluster and run DATC RDF there. And for this demo, we need Docker Desktop installed, and you can find the installation instruction in this link. So Kubernetes cluster setup. The Docker Desktop actually comes with a single node Kubernetes cluster, and we will use that cluster for this demo. So open the Docker Desktop application window and go to Preference and enable the Kubernetes as shown in this screenshot. Then it will install a single node Kubernetes cluster on your laptop. Now uh, we check the installation and we use this kubectl command, uh, which is the Kubernetes command line tool. So to check the cluster installation, uh, run this command. Then you will see that the current context is set as the Docker desktop. And we can also check the available nodes using this command. So you can see here that there's a one node named Docker desktop and it, it is ready now. So the Kubernetes cluster uh, now looks like this. So we have a Kubernetes cluster, which have a single node here. Now we create a namespace uh, where we define all our Kubernetes resources. So the namespace definition is shown below. And actually the, in Kubernetes, we use YAML format to define the Kubernetes resources. And in this case, we are creating the namespace and its name is RDF. So save this YAML file and use the kubectl apply command. Then it will create the namespace RDF. And you can also check the RDF namespace in using this kubectl get command. And you will see namespace is defined here. Now we create a volume, which we use as a storage. Uh, first, create a directory called workspace and put the necessary files for our design experiments. It may include the design files, uh, the Verilog and SDC, and the flow configuration file, and also common open road flow for PNR, which include the flow scripts and PDK libraries. So I already created the workspace directory, which has these two directories. And under this experiment directory, I have the design config file on SDC and the Verilog RTL. And the design config file defines the design name and the platform, which is the Sky 130 nanometer uh, in this case. And I also put the very low file path and the SDC file path. Then in the open world flow directory, I put the platform files and scripts and util utility scripts. So now uh, we create a Kubernetes persistent volume uh, pointing that local directory, the workspace. So we again create a YAML file. Uh, in this case, the resource is persistent volume. And this is the persistent volume name and we are pointing this workspace in this persistent volume. So save the YAML file and run kubectl apply command. Then the persistent volume will be created. And we can check the persistent volume status. So this is the persistent volume name, and the volume is now available. 
And to make the volume usable, uh, we need to create a persistent volume claim. So in this case, we create another YAML file and the resource type is persistent volume claim and we put the volume claim name. So similarly, save the YAML file and, the run, and run the cubectl apply command. Then the persistent volume claim is now created and we can also check the status. The volume claim name here and it's, it's bound to a persistent volume, so it's now usable. So at this point, uh, our Kubernetes cluster, the Docker desktop, uh, looks like this. So we have a single node, but we have more resources now. So we, we have the storage, uh, which it points to our local directory workspace, and it is bound by the persistent volume, and it's, it's made usable by the persistent volume claim. Now we create a pod, uh, which runs the RDF Docker container. So we use the Docker image, the RDF Docker image, which is available in this Docker Hub link. And we allocate two CPUs and eight gigabyte memory for this pod. And we also need the persistent volume for our storage. So here's the YAML file to define the pod. So resource type is now the pod, and this is the pod name. And we have CPU resources and memory resources. And we also have the image name here. And you can also see that we mount the volume at this workspace directory. So save this YAML file and run this kubectl apply command. Then pod for RDF open node is created. And we can also check the pod command, pod status. So you will see this pod name and the status is running. Now the Kubernetes cluster, the Docker desktop looks like this. So we have node and we have the storage resources, but now we have a pod which runs the RDF container inside. So now we can run the PNR job uh, using the THC RDF. So we first get into the pod to make the PNR job. So open a terminal and run this, file, run this command in your terminal. Then the prompt, uh, the terminal prompt has changed it to the uh, pod terminal. So you can see that the pod name is available in this host name. So the pod is now running and we are now in the RDF container. So to make the example uh, PNR task, uh, we go to the workspace experiment directory, which has all the design data. So the, here's the design config file and the timing constraints and RTL is here. So we use the open road make command and run it. Then the PNR flow will run inside the Docker container. So once completed, we close the pod and we now clean up the resources. So we clean up the Kubernetes cluster resources using this kubectl delete command. So we, we delete pod and persistent volume claim, persistent volume, and the namespace. So we will run this command, then it will clean up the resources. So the Kubernetes cluster is now back to the clean state, uh, the initial state. So we have no resources now. So now uh, we check the PNR results. So all the results are stored in this workspace directory. So you can check this workspace directory and you will get all the outcomes from the open road flow. And we can also plot the layout images as we did in the part three using the same scripts. Then we will see these design layout images. Okay, so that was the demonstration for the uh, minimal Kubernetes architecture. <clears throat> so now um, let's try to scale out the cluster so that we can enable even larger scale uh, experiments. So, so um, the single node, single pod cluster that we saw before is a minimal Kubernetes cluster. And as you, as you can see, um, it has just limited compute resource. So to, to enable larger scale of experiments, uh, we want larger Kubernetes cluster having more resources. And one way to achieve that large scale uh, cluster is to scale out the number of containers in our cluster. So then the question is, how can we efficiently distribute uh, multiple experiments across uh, different parts? So uh, in that, uh, for to answer that question, uh, we introduced Ray, which which uh, efficiently distributes multiple different experiments to the um, different parts. So uh, let me introduce Ray a little bit uh, further here. So Ray is a distributed execution uh, framework uh, developed by UC Berkeley. 
It provides a Python, a simple Python API to build distributed application easily. And also Ray works very well with Kubernetes and it also supports other cloud-based uh, clusters. So here's a code example. Um, suppose we have this very simple function and we want to run this function 100 times. Um, and by importing the Ray package and initialize it and putting the uh, function decorator on top of our uh, target function, then we can easily make the function as kind of distributable function on the Ray cluster. So you can see here that Ray has very simplified API to enable the distribution distributed application. So given a function, we can just put the um, necessary decorations around the uh, around the function. Then we can make the um, distributable function easily. So um, now let us use Ray and Kubernetes uh, to enable the distributed experiments even further larger scale. So first we create a multi-container Kubernetes cluster uh, as shown here. Uh, then we describe our experiments using Ray Python API. And finally, we deploy the, our experiments across the Kubernetes cluster uh, using Ray. So here's another demo. Um, in this demo, I will assume that uh, we are kind of given a design and we want to find out the maximum achievable utilization. So what we want to do is uh, build the design multiple times uh, with different flow plan utilization and check whether the flow fails or not. So in the following demo video, uh, I will show you how to use Ray and Kubernetes uh, to distribute such experiments uh, efficiently. In this demo, I will show you how to use Kubernetes cluster together with Ray uh, to make a distributed design experiment. So first, Kubernetes cluster setup. We use the same Docker desktop cluster as in the previous demo, so we check whether the cluster is ready, and we also check the available nodes. And we create the namespace and volume. And I have already created three YAML files for namespace, persistent volume, and persistent volume claim. So I will apply them and I get namespace, persistent volume, and persistent volume claim in our cluster. And we now create pods. And different from the previous demo, we are going to spawn multiple pods uh, because we want to create a multi-container cluster in this case. And specifically in this demo, we create two pods each with two CPUs available. And for this, uh, we use this command. And this command actually uses a tool called Helm Package Manager, which is used for creating desired Kubernetes resources efficiently. And although I will skip the details of this command in this demo, uh, but you can find more information at our tutorial repository shown here. So please visit this GitHub repository to get more information about this demo. And now we check the deployed pods and you will see these two paths, which are all running. And now, uh, to use the Kubernetes cluster for Ray, uh, we have to expose a network port, because Ray need to have a network port to access all those paths uh, running in our Kubernetes cluster. So open a terminal window and execute this command. And at this point, uh, our Kubernetes cluster looks like this. So we have a single node, and we have storage resources shown here. And we have two paths, each running DATCRDF Docker container. And we also have opened a network port, so Ray can distribute the job to individual paths. So now let's talk about the Ray. So we first, to, we first need to initialize Ray by the following codes. So we import the Ray package and we run the Ray init command. And we run this Ray available resources function uh, to get node information. So we have two nodes and the total CPU in this cluster is four because we have two paths each with two CPUs. So first, uh, let us test whether the Ray distributed test in a different path using a simple task. So here's my test function. Uh, it just wait one second. So it's a very simple function. And we invoke this function 10 times and see whether Ray distributes each invocation. So the 10 function calls are all completed, and you can see that uh, individual function call has different paths. For, in for instance, this job 1 is deployed at Ray head pod, but job 2 is deployed in this Ray cluster Ray worker pod. 
So we can check that uh, Ray is distributing our job efficiently. And now uh, let's run the actual design flow experiment. So we have to define a function for a distributed experiment. And in this demo, uh, our goal is to find a maximum achievable utilization for a given design. So what we do is uh, we write a function that describes the design flow modification ex and execution. So first, uh, it will copy the experiment template, which, have, uh, which has design file, scripts, and other design collateral. And we modify the flow. Uh, for instance, in this case, we change the utilization. And then finally, we execute the flow. And once we define the function, uh, we put the Ray decorator so that the function can be deployable using the Ray API. So here's my function. Uh, I have this Ray decorator, and I describe these three operations. So we copy the experiment template, and we change the utilization, and finally, we execute the flow. So I will define this function, and now let's run the experiments. So in this demo, uh, I will set this min and max utilization as 40% and 60% uh, with 2% two, two step. So the experiments will run 11 times, uh, each with different utilization. So here's the function invocation scripts, so I will run it. So all the experiments are now completed. So once it's done, uh, we clean up the resources. So first, uh, we shut down Ray. And we delete the old resources by the following commands, uh, as we did in the previous demo. So now we analyze the results. So we now check the results and find the maximum achievable utilization for this design. So I wrote this script, uh, which checks the log files and see whether placement succeeded or not. So it basically opened the placement log file and the final log file and analyze the results and show the flow plan utilization information. So once we run this script, uh, it shows the flow plan utilization and the final design utilization. And it shows that the, the flow plan utilization 58 and 60% uh, is unachievable. So the maximum achievable utilization for this design is 56. And also we can check the layout images uh, because open world flow uh, saves the older layout images uh, for the debugging. And we can use that images to see whether the experiments ran properly or not. And the script below uh, plots all the layout images uh, generated by open world flow. So once we run it, then we can get all the layout images generated during the experiment. So we can check the utilization 40 and 42 results all the way down to the utilization 56. Okay, so, so in the previous demo, um, we saw how to use Ray and Kubernetes cluster to make a distributed design of experiments in an efficient and cloud-native way. But the multi-container uh, Kubernetes cluster but still uses a single compute node, uh, so it has still limited uh, scalability. And to further scale out, uh, we now compose a multi-node Kubernetes cluster uh, using public cloud services. So um, uh, major public cloud uh, providers uh, all offer the Kubernetes uh, service. For example, Amazon, the AWS has EKS, uh, the Elastic Kubernetes service. Azure has AKS, Azure Kubernetes service, and Google has GKE, uh, Google, Google Kubernetes engine. And IBM Cloud has IKS, uh, IBM Cloud Kubernetes service. So uh, using the public cloud services, uh, we can create multi-node Kubernetes cluster in minutes uh, with just a few clicks. So here's an example um, which shows how we can create a Kubernetes cluster on IBM Cloud. So you can go to the IBM Cloud website and create account and then uh, create the um, Kubernetes service in the Create Resource menu and choose the desired node type and create the cluster. And after a few minutes, uh, the cluster will be ready for use. So uh, once we create the Kubernetes cluster on public cloud, uh, we can now utilize the uh, multi-node cluster in the same way as we have seen in this part. So uh, because our Kubernetes architecture is just a Kubernetes cluster, so it, it can be deployed 
anywhere. So we don't really need to change anything. So in the next demo, uh, I will show you how to deploy these distributed experiments on public cloud uh, using Ray, Kubernetes, and public cloud services again. In this demo, I will show you how to make distributed design experiments on a public cloud multi-node Kubernetes cluster. So we assume that the Kubernetes cluster is running on IBM Cloud, and we have installed IBM Cloud command line interface on our laptop. So this is my Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I have IBM Cloud Kubernetes cluster shown here, which is named RDF Kubernetes cluster, and I have three nodes in this cluster. So for Kubernetes cluster setup for IBM Cloud, uh, we use our own Kubernetes cluster running on IBM Cloud, so we first need to check whether we can access it from our laptop. So this command will show you the available Kubernetes cluster running on IBM Cloud. And you will see the cluster name, RDF Kubernetes Cluster, which is uh, stat status normal. So now we install the cluster information on our local machine. And this following command will install the cluster information on your laptop. So from the log message, you can see that the configuration for this cluster was downloaded successfully. And we can now execute the kubectl commands against the R cluster. So uh, now let's check whether the Kubernetes cluster is act really activated. So the Kubernetes con current context is RDF Kubernetes cluster. And now we check the Kubernetes nodes. And we see three different nodes, so which is different from the previous single node example. So now let's move on to the namespace and volume. So we first we create a namespace as we did in the previous demo. So I have the YAML file already. So the namespace RDF is created and the RDF namespace is now active. Then we now create a volume for the workspace. So different from the previous example, uh, we use this time the cloud storage uh, since we use public cloud service. And each pro cloud provider actually has different mechanism for storage provisioning. And this YAML file shown here uh, is an example for IBM Cloud. It provisions a 20 gigabyte storage and create persistent volume and then persistent volume claim. So I have this YAML file saved as this name and I, I will apply this YAML file to get the storage running on public cloud. And now uh, we check the created volume by running this command. So we have the RDF workspace persistent volume uh, which is bound and you can check the capacity 20 gigabyte here. So now let's move on to the next step. So in this demo, uh, the storage is actually on IBM Cloud. So we have to transfer the necessary files for our experiments. And there are actually multiple ways uh, depending on the cloud providers. And here we use a cloud agnostic way to transfer the file using only these kubectl commands. So what we do is uh, we create a minimal Linux pod and mount the persistent volume on that pod. Then we use the kubectl copy command to transfer the local files to the pod with the destination path to the persistent volume. So uh, we create a mini minimal Linux pod using this command. And the pod is now running, so we can copy the local files to the pod. So the file transfer has completed now, so we can see the files are all transferred to the public cloud. And we check the file transfer results using this command. Then you will see the experiment template and open workflow is now available on our public cloud service. Now let's create pods. So in this demo, we use the same commands as in the previous uh, single node rate example, uh, except the number of workers. And in this case, we create eight workers, and uh, this time uh, each with two CPUs available. So we use this command. Then you will create the eight pods running the DHC RDF container. Now we check the deployed pods. And we will see the RDF pods. Uh, we will see eight RDF pods running on this cluster. And with all these pods running, uh, we move on to the next step, which is the networking. So it, as in the previous example, uh, we need to open a network port so that Ray can distribute jobs across the pods. So I copy this command and run it on the terminal. So at this moment, uh, our Kubernetes cluster now has uh, multiple nodes running on IBM Cloud. And we specifically had three nodes, each with eight CPUs, and we have storage uh, resources available also in the IBM Cloud Kubernetes cluster. 
and we have multiple paths, actually eight paths, each running the RDF Docker container. And we also open the network port so that the Ray can distribute the jobs across different paths. So now let's move on to the Ray. So as we have done in the single node Ray Kubernetes cluster example, uh, we use the same Python API to initialize Ray. So we import the Ray and run the Ray initialization function. Then we check the available resources using this function. So we will see that the, there are eight nodes available as shown here. And we have total CPUs of 16. Now let's test the Ray. So as in this previous example, uh, we first test whether Ray distributed task in different parts uh, using very simple task. So this is the same task, just wait, just wait for one second. So I define this function. And it, this time I will invoke the function 30 times using this script and see whether Ray distributes on the multiple parts. So now the function is running. So looking at the log messages, uh, you will see that different IPs are used. So for instance, job 2 using this IP ending with 98, but job 3 using the IP ending with 99, and job 4 is running on head node, and job 5 using different IP again. So Ray is actively using different parts for, di distrib for distributing the multiple jobs. So now let's move on to the design flow experiment. So we assume the same scenario as in the previous demo. So our goal is to find a maximum achievable utilization for a given design. So we write a function that copies the experiment template and modify the flow, actually changing the utilization. And we execute the flow and the function will be decorated using the Ray decorator. So here's the same function definition as in the previous demo. So I will define the function. Then now run the experiment. So in this demo, I will use min-max utilization 40 and 60% with the first with the 1% step. So the experiment will run in uh, 21 times, uh, each with different utilization. So this is the script that I use for the launching the experiment. So I will run it. So after launching this function, uh, you will notice that Ray actively using all the paths. So right after this function invocation, you will see different paths are running the different flow plan utilization. So now all the experiments completed. So we can see that all the experiments are done. So let's clean up the resources. So we first shut down the Ray. Then in this case, our data is still in cloud. So before cleaning up the resources, uh, we download data to our local machine. And we use the same kubectl copy command here. So here's the command. So now the download has completed and we check the downloaded files. So just to make sure. So you will see all the experiments data are now downloaded in our local laptop. So now we delete all the resources uh, using the following command, uh, which is same as the previous demo. Now our Kubernetes cluster resources are all cleaned up. And also be aware that the public cloud service is not free. So when you don't need the cluster anymore, uh, please delete the cluster completely. And in IBM Cloud case, uh, you can use the following example command to delete your cluster. Now let's analyze the results. So we use the same scripts as in the previous demo. Uh, so for each utilization, uh, I will investigate the placement log file and also the final log file. Then it will show the flow plan for each uh, flow plan utilization. Uh, it will show the design final utilization. And we can check that the maximum achievable utilization is 56%, which is the same as the previous demo. And we can also check the layout images uh, generated by OpenRoad as in the previous demo. So you, we use the same scripts as in the previous demo. Then we will see the, all the layout files generated by OpenRoad uh, during the experiments. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the quick summary of the um, part three of my presentation. Um, so we know that the machine learning and so MLCAT requires data, and so it needs a significant amount of time and compute resources. And in this part, uh, I presented uh, how to utilize public cloud services uh, to efficiently generate large amount of data for MLCAT application. 
uh, specifically, I showed how to deploy large scale experiments on public cloud services uh, using Ray, Kubernetes, and Docker in a generic and cloud native way. So you, you can find all the example code and notebooks uh, in this GitHub link. And uh, so let me actually conclude my uh, today's presentation here. So uh, DATC is a technical committee under IT Presida, and we are working to establish and expand uh, research foundations for IC physical design and ML enabled EDA. And in the first part of my presentation, uh, I, I introduced the latest five DATC's activities, uh, DATC RDF, the reference design flow, the standardized metric system, uh, golden calibration data sets, uh, modern and complete benchmarks for physical design, and cloud native enablement of large scale uh, design of experiments. And in the second part, uh, I introduced RDF flow and showed the demo. And in the third part, uh, we learned how to enable the large scale experiments on cloud uh, using Docker, Kubernetes, and Ray. So uh, this work was supported by IEEE SIDA, and everything presented in my presentation uh, was not done by just me. Uh, all of the work were collaboration with the current and former members of DATC, as well as the um, US UCSD ABK Group's members. So um, uh, that's all. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, here's my email. So if you have any question about my presentation after uh, later, then you can uh, feel free to reach, reach me out. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jingwu. Uh, so for this excellent talk and this really amazing demonstrations, right? So we do <laughs> have some questions and actually uh, our student call and uh, Dr. Karenju, actually he's a postdoc. Uh, he can help to organize some of this. Could you help Karen? Sure. We do have yeah. some questions here. <laughs> yeah, I also have some questions. So thanks to Dr. Jiang on the talk. Uh, so the first question from is actually from me. So I'm I'm curious, like, so you show that like a lot of really impressive results. How do you think this robust flow will uh, perform across different technology? For example, planar CMOS, spin fat, and even 3D IC, those kind of thing. I suppose they have different uh, paradigm or different styles. So how, how can the robust flow handle different technology? And I also have a question on the PDK. So we know that a lot of PDK in the industry right now, they have the NDA issue, for example, from Samsung, from TSMC. How can open source community handle the PDK issue for, for technology? Okay, so um, the second question is really <laughs> difficult question to me, but anyway, let me... Uh, answer your first question regarding the um supporting different technology in the RDF. Is, is that right question, right? Yeah. So, By the um, way, yeah. so uh, Jun Wu, right? You can also screw up the chat. Can you see the chat? Uh, or oh, you don't have to. Maybe you don't do the full screen, right? Oh, okay. Now I can see the chat. Okay. Okay. Yes. Cool. All right. Thanks. Or, um. The, so actually, the DATC RDF flow originally built on top of the um research outcomes let me actually go to the um uh, flow diagram here can you see this idea uh, okay so as you can see here all the tools are originally from the um, cat contest which don't really support diverse uh, diverse technology they are designed or assuming the um specific contain contest benchmarks and technology. So in the sense, these tools don't really support the um, different technology very well, but the open road, as you know, open road supports the um, standard um, industry format. Left Dev is fully, almost fully supported and Liberty is also fully supported. So using open road, if the different technology has the um, standard industry format, then we can support the um, different technology in the RDF flow as well. Does that answer your first question? Yeah. And for the second question, the um, closed PDK, um, <laughs> it, it's really difficult because I don't really have an answer. But if, um, but again, the the um, commercial PDK are all providing the standard industry format, left dev and liberty, and we also have some uh, internal experience of using the open road tool for the commercial PDK, and it, it works very well. Although it doesn't really guarantee the um, 
um, sign of quality or DLV design rule violation free results, meaning that um, if you go to the open road uh, flow script or open road repository, it has some list of the um, supported PDK and standard cell library, and which does include the um, some of the commercial PDK and library. So if the um, if your PDK and commercial libraries are included in that list, then RDF actually the open road can support such uh, commercial or um, private PDK and standard cell library. But if the uh, commercial and standard cell library are not included in the supported list, uh, we can, uh, although we can launch the flow, but the quality won't be guaranteed or we cannot really obtain a reliable results from there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for a great answer. So we do have an, a few other questions. This question is from Jia Chigu. So he is mm -hmm. asking, uh, could you comment on the uh, extendability, extendability and adaptability on the, the, the RDF flow, especially for the open source community to contribute and incorporate the new tools in the ecosystem. So I guess it's asking, so how can the open source community contribute mm -hmm. back to the RDF flow? Oh yeah, so one thing is that you can just <laughs> reach out to me so we can discuss if you have some good tool to be look good tool you want to include in RDF of inventory then the easiest way is just talk to me <laughs> and the other way is we we do have some github repository although i didn't really show you the um reference page here so if you go to our actually the github.com i triple c the datc uh, you can create a pull request for the datc rdf and in that manner, we can actually follow the um, usual open source practice to include your tool in the um, DATC RDF as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the answer. So I think uh, we also have two questions here. They are actually the same question. So you mentioned about the, the EDA the, the EDA on the cloud. It's really mm -hmm. nice. And you show an example on swapping the utilization ratio, if I remember correctly. So mm -hmm. how do you think, uh, is it possible that the, the parallelization, uh, the, the instances why it can actually help uh, improve the scalability or even the QR of the, the EDA tools? For example, maybe you can run a place and route on a bigger partition, which will cannot be done before using a single node. Okay, so one thing we can do is, although I just show you that the um the maximum utilization example, I think, uh, yeah, this one. So in our example, we actually just try multiple utilization and try to find the um. Uh, achievable utilization, which is a simple example, but we can also do uh, some of flow tuning kind of um, experiment, like given a flow and given a design uh, within a given a constraint, we can try to find the um, optimal flow parameter, like what is the um, best, what is the um, optimal global placement density, or what is the um, optimal the routing resource adjustment or that, that sort of all different flow parameter. We can try to tune such flow parameter using this kind of a distributed um, uh, scalable environment. That could be one interesting um, direction. And regarding your question, like uh, if we are given a big design and we want to distribute it on the um, this multi-cloud uh, environment, then uh, the open source tool or the EDA tool behind should support um, very extensive parallelism. Do, do, do you follow what I mean? Uh, so this yeah. environment or this demonstration actually kind of individual scenario or individual trial are kind of confined flow. We individual flow or individual part just run a single design, single flow. But if, but as you mentioned, we can even uh, if the tool supports extensive parallelism, then we can also it, uh, inject the Ray framework into your tool so that the Ray can distribute the individual partition to the different uh, paths and nodes here. So we can also do that, but we haven't really seen such results yet. But that could be also very interesting results as well. Mm. Yeah, this sounds very good. Yeah, they're very interesting indeed. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. So, so uh, maybe I can comment a little bit. So yeah, this is a great point, right? So right now you have a you can distribute the job, right? But then the algorithm mm -hmm. itself, right? If we can have more parallel cloud-based EDA algorithms, right? That's right. That, uh, can also you know run much bigger jobs, right? So I guess uh, that's a probably an interesting research direction, right? Okay. Here. Okay. Yeah, I also have a question next. If we, uh, uh, I can ask. Oh yeah, I, I see your question in chat. Yeah. So plan for analog? <laughs> we have no really plan, uh, any plan yet regarding the um, analog uh, flow. Well, if you're interested, you can join the DATC and <laughs> you can enable analog from there. Well, oh, Karen, you know, he has worked a lot on Magical. He's one of the main authors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So, okay. Uh, any other questions? Looks like there is no question in the chat, right? So, uh, if any of you would like to unmute and just ask maybe one last uh, question, feel free. Right? So, it's your opportunity. Well, uh, if not, uh, okay, uh, thanks very much again, uh, Jin Wu, for your excellent talk and uh, excellent demo. Right? We really enjoy it. And all right, uh, last but not least, uh, let me share uh, the screen. And uh, we also just want uh, to remind you, right? So we have three, uh, you know, talks tomorrow. Uh, let me share this. So, um, same time, right? So uh, nine o'clock central, seven uh, a.m. in California time, and uh, you know you can pretty much actually you know uh, it's the same time. So um, we have uh, three talks on manufacturability, reliability, security, and uh, so on, right? So uh, please uh, stay tuned and uh, look forward to see you tomorrow. And also, uh, thanks again to Karen, Richard, uh, Akhilesh, and uh, last but not least, Jin Wu for the great talks today. And I hope you have a wonderful uh, day and evening, night, wherever you are. And also, thanks, uh, happy Thanksgiving next week. Right? But anyway, uh, see you tomorrow. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.